Hello, I'm Sachin Gupta, VPGM for Infrastructure at Google Cloud. The roles of enterprise architects and developers are evolving. Not only do you have to keep the lights on, you are expected to stay on top of the ever-changing trends and technologies that create business value. And you have to do all of this while lowering costs and improving performance, so IT infrastructure runs quickly and smoothly. Your role is critical to a successful transformation. For example, adopting technologies like AI ML and containers is becoming vital to businesses, with more than 76% of surveyed enterprises saying that AI projects are their top priority. And meanwhile, security breaches are so common these days, it doesn't even make the top news. They are disruptive and costly, and can be avoided with the right preventative methods. After all, as Gardner says, 99% of cloud breaches are due to human error. With Google Cloud, you can innovate faster and more easily while optimizing costs. We know organizations like yours still have a lot of infrastructure to migrate, and we are committed to helping you migrate more securely and efficiently. Global customers and local partners like Palo Alto Networks, H&M, and Major League Baseball rely on us to deliver scalable, high-performing, highly available cloud infrastructure and services. A big area we're investing in is the expansion of our global footprint to meet the unprecedented global customer demand. Today, I'll be discussing how we are partnering with you to help drive business value in three key ways. First, we are driving business transformation and achieving new outcomes with industry-leading AI ML, unparalleled security, and modern infrastructure services and solutions that are designed for your industry. Second, we are helping you optimize your workload performance while reducing costs. And finally, from migration to management, our mission is to help you unlock this value simply and easily. Customers come to Google Cloud to transform and innovate. Let me share a little more about how we are driving this change through AI leadership, invisible security, and cutting edge industry solutions. AI is in our DNA. From AI powered search to YouTube recommendation engines and Google Assistant, we have decades of experience running scaled, diverse ML workloads and industry-leading AI infrastructure products and solutions. Wayfair is using Vertex AI to forecast global customer demand, ensuring customers can quickly access what they need, and to automate and personalize AI-powered customer support. Salesforce is using performance-optimized cloud TPU v4 for conversational scale-out AI. These outcomes are made possible because of the innovation across our AI stack. And it starts with hardware choices and performance that help you keep pushing the limits of AI in large models. Cloud TPU v4 delivers industry-leading ML training performance and scale. With six terabits per second interconnect, you can run large-scale training workloads up to 80% faster and up to 50% cheaper compared to alternatives. And that's how companies like Cohere deliver cutting edge natural language processing faster and with a lower carbon footprint. We're also announcing new A2 Ultra GPUs built on NVIDIA's A180 gig GPUs with high speed memory. AI Singapore has reduced the loading time of large scale language models by 40% and increased throughput by over 50% with A2+, resulting in increased productivity. And customers are also using Google Batch to orchestrate and schedule AI jobs of any scale. With Batch, our customer Locomation was able to unlock AI insights from their autonomous trucks 80% faster. Google is committed to making AI and machine learning more open and accessible. To further this, in partnership with Meta, we recently co-founded the PyTorch Foundation. And for over a decade, we've contributed to critical AI projects like TensorFlow and Jax. 
Today, we are announcing a new industry consortium, the Open XLA project that will unite an ecosystem of leading machine learning compiler technologies and accelerate and simplify machine learning innovation. These open source AI contributions enable you to take your AI idea and turn it into reality easily and at low cost. Next, I want to share how we're transforming security. At Google Cloud, we are championing a future of invisible security, where security is engineered in and operations are simplified. We package the expertise that we use to protect our own business and our billions of users and make it available to you. You can easily deploy a wide range of tools depending on your own risk profile, from prevention to detection to remediation. Today, I want to highlight the next step in our cybersecurity journey as we welcome Mandiant to Google Cloud. By taking advantage of Google Cloud's existing security portfolio, our Google Cybersecurity Action Team and Mandiant's leading cyber threat intelligence, you can stay protected at every stage of the security lifecycle. Cloud Armor is another security innovation that provides advanced ML-powered DDoS and WAF protection for web apps, services, and APIs. It has prevented some of the largest DDoS attacks on the planet with zero impact to customers. Recently, the largest HTTPS attack was staged against a Cloud Armor customer. It was 76% larger than anything previously reported, the equivalent of Wikipedia's daily requests in 10 seconds. And the customer experienced no impact. And for regulated industries with stringent and country-specific requirements, we offer controls to meet your digital sovereignty objectives. Sovereign controls allows you to define the location of your core data, set access permissions, and control your cryptographic keys. Supervised Cloud, which is coming soon, is a fully partner-managed and operated solution that supports data, operational sovereignty needs, and country or region-specific regulatory requirements. For highly sensitive workloads that require the most stringent security requirements, Hosted Cloud offers air-gapped hardware and software, including managed infrastructure, AI ML, and database services. Since transformation takes different forms for different industries, we partner with customers to build industry-leading, innovative solutions. Together with the CME Group, we plan to transform the derivatives market through technology, expanding access, and creating efficiencies for market participants. In telecom, communication service providers like Bell Canada rely on Google's network to expand globally and deploy 5G networks with Google Distributed Cloud Edge. Google Distributed Cloud Edge GPU-optimized configurations bring the power of GPU acceleration and machine learning to enable the future of retail. Customers and partners such as 66 Degrees, AWM Smart Shelf, and Ipsotech are using GPU optimization to deliver innovative retail solutions at the edge, including AR in the store, shelf stockout notifications for quicker restocking, and cashierless checkout to reduce lines. In media and entertainment, we provide solutions to customers like Unext, with streaming built on the same Google infrastructure we've tested and tuned to serve YouTube's two billion users globally. To get a better picture of how our media and entertainment industry customers innovate with Google Cloud, I'm proud to introduce Senior Vice President, Technical Infrastructure of Major League Baseball, Truman Boys. Major League Baseball's technology mission is to connect with our fans. Our infrastructure team has historically maintained applications on-prem, and now we have unlimited compute from the public cloud, and this allowed us to shut down four data centers, modernize all of our infrastructure, and to spin things up rapidly. And in the off-season, we scale it back. Google's cloud helps us to understand the entire fan journey 
and artificial intelligence allows us to derive a better connection to them. We're able to have personalized content with that fan. It gets richer over time as we learn more about them. Working with Google, we're preserving the history of baseball, going back into the 1940s, and we're able to make highlights available to our fans. Google Cloud hosts all of these video clips for us. And now we have an opportunity to enrich this format beyond what it is today. We're looking to modernize the entire platform that we have and move into delivery through Media CDN. Major League Baseball and Google Cloud are connecting with our fans, so that experience is happening in venue as well as a digital experience, and we're knocking it out of the park. Thank you so much, Truman. It is amazing to see how MLB is innovating for the fan experience, leveraging Google technologies like AI, media CDN, and the reliability and elasticity of our global infrastructure. We've shared a number of ways in which we've built our infrastructure to enable transformation. But we also continue to build solutions and products tuned to support your top workloads and data applications. And we've optimized these for both performance and cost. One example of this is Google Cloud VMware Engine. VMware Engine is a fully managed native Google service that helps you lift and shift your VMware applications to Google Cloud faster and easier. We are the first external provider to support VMware's Cloud Universal Program, which makes it easier for you to migrate to the cloud. And with built-in point-and-click migration tools and our instant provisioning feature, you can get workloads running in your private cloud in less than one hour. Customers like LIQ have saved 60% in infrastructure costs with VMware Engine by migrating 80% of their business applications and half of their databases. We are continuing to scale VMware Engine by increasing support from 64 to 96 nodes per private cloud, all with four nines of availability in a single site and a dedicated 100 gigabit per second network. This provides high performance and reliability for your most demanding production workloads. It is no wonder that customers like Mitel could overhaul their unified communications platform and data infrastructure with VMware Engine in less than 90 days. Another example of workload optimization is a recently announced Google Cloud High Performance Computing Toolkit. Several decades ago, Quantum computing was just a concept. But now, with HPC Toolkit, quantum AI is easy and accessible. HPC Toolkit is an open source tool from Google that helps you quickly and easily create repeatable turnkey HPC clusters. The toolkit comes with several blueprints and broad support for third-party components such as the Slurm Scheduler, Intel DAOs, and DDN Luster Storage. Next, I'm really excited to announce C3 VMs. It is the first VM on the market to feature the latest generation of Intel Sapphire Rapids processors and is built on new Intel Google co-designed infrastructure processing units or IPUs. All of this together means differentiated performance, security, isolation, and flexibility. C3 is the first VM in our fleet with 200 gigabits per second low latency networking to support a variety of workloads such as data processing, web serving, and high throughput HPC workloads. Because clusters can be scaled and parallelized more densely, we're seeing customers and partners like Ansys and Snapchat completing jobs faster. And ParallelWorks is seeing 10x faster performance with C3 compared to the prior generation. Contact your sales rep to join our private preview. Moving on to another product built to leverage the IPU, Google Cloud Hyperdisk is the next generation of block storage, which will be available on both Compute Engine and GKE. We are decoupling block storage performance from the VM, allowing you to tune your storage performance to your workload needs. 
we estimate you'll see around 50% better total cost of ownership than persistent disk and 80% higher IOPS per vCPU compared to any other hyperscaler. We have built cost optimization into many of our core products, and we have exciting new capabilities to announce. Our new flexible committed use discounts, or flex cuts, can make it easier to save and manage costs across teams by giving you region and VM family flexibility. With AutoClass, Customers like Redivis are reducing storage costs and achieving better price predictability in a simple way. It automatically transitions objects to cooler storage based on the last time they were accessed and transitions to standard storage upon access. That brings us to the third way we drive business value, ease of use. As cloud platforms have become more versatile, they often have also become more complex to adopt and operate. That's why Google Cloud strives for radical simplicity from migration through management. Speaking of migration, our new migration center can reduce complexity, time, and cost by providing key capabilities in migrating and modernizing to virtual machines, containers, or serverless computing. With Migration Center, Viant, a large media company, in partnership with Slalom, successfully migrated an entire data center to Google Cloud in less than six months. We also have a new offering in our mainframe modernization solution called Dual Run. Dual Run lets you replicate your mainframe workload in Google Cloud and run the two environments in parallel. This allows you to confirm successful operations in Google Cloud before your cutover which can massively reduce risk. And that's why customers and partners across industries, like financial services company Santander, are seeing success with Dual Run. We also want to simplify the way you manage and scale. Managed instance groups, or MIGs, with auto-scaling, use application metrics to radically simplify and improve operational efficiency, allowing you to scale in and out without manual intervention. And with the power of Google's ML, MIX can predictably scale in and out based on historical data. These three defining pillars for Google Cloud infrastructure, transformative, optimized, and easy, are the key tenets behind our intentional engineering efforts. This is why so many customers trust Google Cloud and what helps to power such innovation across the industry. I invite you to try Google Cloud and our innovative new releases. We look forward to delighting you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. When you're trying to build a national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work.
everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you are enjoying Google Cloud Next. Welcome to this session on how to lower your cost on Google Cloud. We have a panel of experts today to talk about top leading practices for cloud cost optimization. My name is Pathik, and I lead cost optimization in Cloud FinOps digital transformation practice. Joining me here is Yasmin, who is product lead for cost optimization on Google Cloud Compute Services, and Courtney, who leads Cloud FinOps at General Mills. We have a packed agenda today to talk about real world stories on how General Mills approached the discipline of cost savings and accelerated their adoption of Cloud FinOps. Next up, we will touch upon the broader landscape and top ways other cloud customers are optimizing their spend. And finally, wrap up the session with the newest features and announcements coming out at this next. Before we dive right in, Courtney, can you tell us a bit more about General Mills? Absolutely, Pathak. General Mills has been making world food the world loves for more than 150 years. The brands you see down in the corner are just a handful that feed families across the globe each and every day. And our team of 36,000 plus employees are passionate about making food the world loves. This mission comes to life in everything we do, including our cloud transformation journey. We view cloud as a key business accelerator. It's a way that we're able to enhance operational insights by connecting data both internally as well as externally to build more personalized products, make faster supply and demand planning decisions, and provide better service and reliabilities to our customers and partners. It's also driving efficiencies for us, creating a scalable IT platform at a competitive cost, and unlocking new services and offerings, allowing us to utilize cloud native capabilities to build new digital services and offerings in an agile manner. The graphs below help to really highlight the journey General Mills has been on. As you can see, we started in 2020 with just 5% of our footprint on cloud. We're now around 35% and anticipating by 2024 that we'll be at 65%. So we're really in that sharp growth curve right now. And it's been critical as our cloud spending is growing to grow our governance right along with it. And FinOps is a critical part of that growth. The FinOps team is focused on ensuring we help to drive waste out of our cloud usage at General Mills. It's great to see, Courtney, that you have a team focused on this. So speaking of efficiencies, what has been your biggest driver of cost optimization and efficiency? Yeah, for us, that's really been committed use discounts, Yasmin. And that's CUDs for short. So we're migrating our ERP systems to GCP, and these CUDs have allowed us to optimize our data center bill by more than 50%. Resource-based CUDs are a really good fit for optimization um, on our machines because we know they need to run 24-7 in order to serve our global business. Once we were confident in the machine sizes, putting the long-term CUDs on these stable workloads has been a big cost savings win. Committing to resources for a long time horizon, though, isn't a decision that we make lightly. We have a robust governance process around these commitments with cross-functional stakeholders weighing in and a formal purchase approval process before we buy. In addition to CUDs, we're also starting to dip our toes into another rate optimization tool, which is BigQuery slots reservations. And these are really good on our analytic workloads. We're taking advantage of this opportunity for our non-prod projects today and excited to expand into our prod projects in the near future. While CUDs and slots are a great optimization fit for several of our projects, they aren't right for all and we are striving for flexibility. I was excited to hear that the Google team has a new type of CUD that's going to be available soon that's even more flexible. That is right, Courtney. We are so happy to announce the general availability of a new type of a spend-based commitment for a compute engine called Flexible Committed Use Discounts, or Flex CUDs for short. Flex CUDs will help customers save up to 46% off the on-demand GCE VM pricing in exchange for one or three year commitments. Flex CUDs are ideal for predictable spend across GCE, JKE, and Dataproc. Those discounts will just automatically apply to most general purpose and compute optimized VMs in any region, any machine family, any operating system. So there's a great deal of flexibility here. And it also works across all projects within the billing account. 
So whether your workload requirements change, you expand geographically, or you want to upgrade to the latest and greatest VM we have, FlexCuds will just provide you a simple and easy way to save money and manage spend. So Courtney, you've told us about like how rate optimization has been very effective at General Mills for saving costs using CUDs or using BigQuery slots. I'm curious, like what other ways have you been saving costs around? Yeah, absolutely. One of the other really critical things that we've done is start to look at cost controls, Yasmin. And it is, of course, easy to get excited about lowering the bill and, you know, put some spend mitigation on the back burner. Um, but unfortunately, we learned this one the hard way with one project accruing over $80,000 of anomalous charges um, due to a lack of partitioning and clustering of a BigQuery data set. The quotas that we now have in place effectively limit the amount both individuals and a team can spend in a rolling 24-hour basis. Most of our projects have a $1,000 limit, so obviously a much lower ceiling if you do have that oops moment. Uh, my advice is really to teams prioritize quotas now, prioritize cost controls. Don't wait for you know, a costly financial mistake. Thanks for sharing the lessons learned. Um, and, and I love how you've strengthened the overall process um, while going through this. We've been seeing some of our customers create a cookbook of recipes such as these cost control policies and design an end-to-end -end automation workflow to handle these ops moments, like this oops moments at scale. Since we are on the topic of BigQuery um, and our customers love using BigQuery, um, I'm curious to see if you find any other opportunities in your data analytics workload. Yeah, absolutely, Patik. We are also heavy BigQuery users at General Mills. Um, and one area where we have found a lot of savings on BigQuery is through optimizing our data backup costs. We started by digging into policy requirements and realized that we had been capturing a snapshot each day of the month, so you know, usually around 30. Uh, by examining the policy as well as our business need, we were able to move to just a rolling seven-day backup and then some weekly snapshots. This allowed us to drop nearly 20 additional backup copies per month that we had been using. Uh, and the team has really been awesome. They've taken it even one step further here and they're currently deploying the table snapshot functionality, which allows us to just capture that incremental data that has changed and further reduce costs. This work also has the added benefit of providing more transparency to the team. So we're moving from one central backup project to having that distributed across all the individual consuming projects. It's been a really big win that way in terms of transparency and really fabulous work by our overall engineering team to bring this to life. And it's hard to argue with savings of over 70%. So really fabulous work by the team. I, I love the numbers you just shared and kudos to the team for achieving these impressive results. Let me throw a curveball question here. Um, we have been increasingly seeing customers use cloud-native architectures, and serverless services just play a very critical role there. Have General Mills adopted serverless? Any thoughts you would like to share us there? Yeah, absolutely. So there's been a couple of things that I, I think we can share on this, a couple quick examples of teams that, through a willingness to really explore other tools to still meet their business deliverables, have been able to achieve some significant cost savings, Patik. Um, two quick examples here. The first is the use of BI Engine to redirect the majority of one of our project team's report query usage to BI Engine from BigQuery database processing. The BI Engine provides a fixed monthly cost that was 80% less than running the same processing through BigQuery. We have another group who's also been uh, working with the new Composer functionality that has auto-scaling built in. And this team, through that auto-scaling functionality, has been able to drive 60% out of our Composer costs as well. So another really significant win for the team um, through that willingness to think about trade-offs in different services that can still meet our business need. 60%, 80%, those are like great success stories, wow. I love that you're using all of these techniques to ensure that you're spending your money on the right resources like to achieve the right business results. Absolutely, Yasmin, and the team has done some really impressive work, but we are still, I would say, relatively early in our cloud journey. So I'd love to hear from you. What are other teams doing? What are some other best practices out there? 
Absolutely. So we see really like a whole spectrum of cost optimization strategies for customer with varying levels of effort and savings. What you see here on the screen are the top 10 ways our customers have been leveraging to lower their cloud costs. Depending upon the use case, some strategies are going to provide highest value with minimal effort. Think about like purchasing flexible committed use discounts or the regular committed use discounts, reserving big query slots. So similar to what you've been doing at General Mills, really. There are other strategies that can be employed during the architecture and design phase. So think like before even deploying your workload to the cloud, like auto scaling, choosing the custom VMs and to right size your machines based on your workload requirements. Other strategies will work great if you are into automation, like turning off idle resources, right sizing your VMs post deployment, and also setting up appropriate storage lifecycle management policies. So Pati, can you tell us like what else have you been seeing? Yeah, I think I think you covered a broad spectrum. Um, what we've been seeing is like a couple examples comes to my mind. Um, you know, we've been seeing customers who use fault tolerant workloads. Uh, they tend to leverage spot VMs, which will help them save up to 91% in uh, cost savings for compute. Um, and just like General Mills, we have been increasingly seeing our Google Cloud customers leverage um, Google managed services, serverless services like BigQuery, Spanner, Bigtable, Cloud SQL, and more to not only reduce the total cost of ownership, but also instill and propel that developer productivity and go-to-market, which is so much needed in this dynamic environment. Talking about more, costs, uh, more ways to save cost, Yasmin, um, can you please tell us you know, what's coming out? Oh, yeah, so that's, that's really exciting. That's the fun part. So I'm gonna share with you like some products that are we are releasing and announcing this next. So starting with products that fit under the category of cost visibility and insights, we are introducing a new cost modeling service to help customers model out and forecast their cost for their upcoming workloads before deploying it to the cloud. We're also enhancing our cost anomalies detection capabilities to provide proactive monitoring and governance to inform customers about any out of the ordinary spending to avoid those like oops moments you've talked about, Courtney. We're also introducing a new Google Cloud Storage Insights service that allows customers to monitor the object age and size trends to forecast and control cost. And finally, using BigQuery partitioning and clustering recommender this can help customers save workload execution costs by providing physical design optimization recommendations that, uh, that customers can apply to their tables. So Pati, can you walk us through the new launches in the cost optimization and recommendation section? A absolutely. Uh, on the cost optimization and recommendation side, we are introducing AutoClass, a new managed service for cloud storage. If I'm allowed to pick my favorite, it would be this one. Mm -hmm. Right. Auto class is a simple bucket level setting that automates the life cycle management of objects. It greatly reduces the storage cost by automatically migrating objects between warmer storage and colder storage with the most favorable pricing. Next up is Cloud Spanner. And this team had a lot of great announcements this year, starting with granular instance sizing, which allows customers to provision one tenth of the size of current node at one-tenth of the price. Now this is game changer, not only for the bigger teams, but also for the smaller teams to unlock creativity, especially those who are tight on budget. Next in Spanner is increased storage capacity per node, which helps you achieve up to 50% savings on compute cost for storage intensive workloads. And as part of our growing portfolio of committed use discounts, Cloud Spanner now supports CURD for one year and three year commitments, which help you save up to 40% compared to on demand rates. Finally, in this category, we are excited to introduce Google Cloud Hyperdisk, the next generation of block storage. This is cool. Cloud Hyperdisk decouples the block storage performance from the VM, so you can tune your storage performance to your workload needs to achieve higher IOPS and throughput performance independent of virtual machines. Cloud Hyperdisk can deliver up to 60% better total cost of ownership than the previous generations of persistent disks. I am looking forward to see the reaction and feedback from General Mills and our customers as they adopt these exciting features. That's right, we're very excited here. That's a lot of great features coming out on top of our already expensive portfolio of ways to save costs. 
So, Pati, can you like walk us through how can we make this like an easy journey for our customers so it doesn't seem so daunting? Yeah, absolutely. And this is where I'm super excited to share like how Active Assist brings the data, intelligence, and machine learning to not only proactively optimize cost, but also improve the availability, the performance, the reliability, as well as go green through sustainability. To showcase how broad and deep the portfolio is, you can see that Active Assist runs through nearly all of Google Cloud. Focusing on cost intelligence, Active Assist does a lot of heavy lifting, understanding your usage patterns, and assessing the impact of billing to provide you with the most optimal cost recommendations. For example, based on your workload usage, Active Assist can provide you easy to understand and actionable committed use discounts recommendations and BigQuery slots recommendations. Active Assist will also surface idle cloud resources, otherwise known as cloud-based, and right-sizing opportunities for virtual machines, databases, and more to further lower your cost. Now, these recommendations are available through console, API, and BigQuery export. We have seen customers use this for automation use cases. The Active Assist team has been hard at work listening to our customers rolling out these relevant features. I highly encourage you to check out our public documentation to keep up to date on this. Now, before we wrap up this session, Courtney, any final piece of advice that you would like to share with us on driving cost optimization at scale? Yeah, absolutely, Patik. Thank you for that. And it's been really great to share some of the early wins that General Mills is seeing and excited about all the new features that you and Yasmin covered that are coming out. But I do want to just take a moment to really emphasize the importance of culture. And so as important as it is to have real-time visibility and reporting, to have this central FinOps team that also is going to be focused on best practice sharing and, and optimization practices across organizations, it's really all of the individual users that come together that make the difference on whether or not an organization will be successful or not. So when we're looking at this, you know, one of the critical things to think about is how can you incentivize the organization to really adopt FinOps? And one thing that we've done around that that's been successful is a little bit silly, but each month we recognize a FinOps all-star. And this all-star could either be an individual or a small team uh, that's done some great work driving waste out of their cloud usage. And we reward them with a highly coveted Yeti mug um, and put their faces, of course, on a cheesy FinOps all-star. Uh, but it's been such a fun way to really incentivize those new habits and just make it an embedded part of the General Mills culture. Agree. Everyone has a responsibility to play here. And I love how you've instilled that cost-conscious behavior through gamification. Speaking of gamification, if you are a developer, don't forget to check out the Developer Zone where we have immersive experience for you to engage with the community, complete the challenges, and earn badges that will stay on your developer profile forever. I would like to thank Yasmin and Courtney for sharing your expertise, and I hope you have enjoyed this session. Thank you for listening to us, and I hope you have fun learning more at this Google Cloud Next.
I'm Priyanka Gurgaria, a staff developer advocate here at Google Cloud, and you are watching the session that's going to teach you all about the secrets of migrating um, with speed, scale, and success. And with me today, we have Jaspal Shahani, who is uh, the VP of SRE and Engineering at Loblaw Technology, and Daniel Dill, who is the Senior Vice President of Application Delivery and Cloud Operations at Global Payment Systems. I'm very excited to have a discussion with both of you today about um, how you all migrated uh, your on-premise infrastructure into Google Cloud. But before we do that, we have a few exciting announcements to share. We just recently launched Dual Run, which is a new service that's part of Google Cloud's mainframe modernization solution. It enables you to simultaneously run workloads on your existing mainframes and on Google Cloud that allows you to perform real-time testing and quickly gather data on performance and stability with no disruption to the business. So do check it out if you're running mainframe systems today and are looking to uh, migrate some of those mainframes in near term into cloud. Now, the next thing we are announcing is the Migration Center, which focuses on helping you reduce your migration project's complexity, time, and cost by providing a centralized integrated migration and modernization experience. Um, if you are migrating, these are the two tools that are definitely going to be uh, great to have in your toolkit. With that in mind, we have a great segue to our main event today that I am very, very excited about, uh, which is our customer panel on migration. So with that, uh, both Jaspal and Danielle, uh, I want to uh, one by one kick, kick it off to you to explain a little bit about um, your company. Uh, let's start with you, Jaspal, explain about um, Loblaw technology and uh, why did you decide to migrate in the first place? Lobla is the biggest retailer in Canada, 2,500 store. We are a hundred year old plus company. Uh, what we found as we were trying to scale our businesses is that we wanted to spend our energy towards building products instead of having to manage infrastructure. That's not our core competency. Uh, and that kind of underpinned the whole decision as to, you know, why go uh, there was also an aspect of developer experience, which we wanted to get it. We wanted to bring our teams together so that uh, a developer and a marketer should be able to go have the conversation using the same set of tools uh, and get a faster you know, time to market. Um, Danielle, I'd like, love to switch to you. Um, what, what does um, the, what was the motivation behind migrating in the first place? Uh, thanks, Priyanka. Global payments, we're a, a industry leader in payments, payroll, uh, and point of sale technologies. Um, we've grown a lot through acquisition. And with those with, with that acquisition comes a large number of data centers. Uh, so one of the last numbers I saw, we had somewhere around, I think, 70 data centers. Um, and that's just a large capital investment, uh, both to keep those up to date and also the staff required to run those in a in a secure, compliant manner. You know, since we're in the payments industry, we have to follow all the PCI guidelines and and you know everything needs to be super secure. And so it takes a lot to keep just equipment refreshed. Um, there's also you know, a big driver to get out of that rat race of equipment refreshes. Um, it takes a lot of high risk maintenance activities. And so you're just continuously churning, doing the same functions over and over. And so we really wanted to get our workforce, our, our engineers out of that, out of that and let them innovate and, and do more interesting things than just refresh in the life equipment inside a data center. Okay, great. So um, this question is not a surprise. I was definitely going to ask this one. Um, why did you pick Google Cloud? Jaspal, why don't we start with you? As I, as I mentioned, we wanted to keep our teams and bring our teams closer 
So that was one. The other aspect of it was we wanted to uh, build things right from the get go and not be, you know, just inheriting ways of doing things and replicating our org structure. I feel those were the two main drivers for us to pick up Google Cloud. Daniel? Um, we already had a number of environments running in Google Cloud. Uh, we had a merchant portal that's used for servicing our customers. We have a data lake, a main API platform. So we were we were already familiar with the with the Google Cloud technology. Um, also, when we put out the RFP for the program, we were really impressed with what Google brought to the table. They've invested a lot in their Google Cloud technology. Um, and then also Google was willing to use our service. So we were processing Google transactions on Google Google Cloud. So Google on Google, you might say. And we're just, we're really excited about the innovative capability uh, between the two companies that, that we can use to help our current merchants grow. It's like a 360 degree connection from different angles. Um, amazing to hear. So now that we've covered what made you decide to migrate in the first place, the background um, of why to mig why migration in the first place, and then why picking Google Cloud, um, naturally, I want to progress towards how did you actually accomplish the task of migrating? Because um, that must have been a long process in some ways. Um, was it short? I'm curious about that too. Um, but um, let's start with you, Daniel. Um, how did Google Payments um, migrate to Google Cloud? Um, I, I think we have taken every approach out there. Um, in, in some of our first, first initiatives, we used very much a, a lift and shift approach. So the end result really looked and felt like it was just another one of our data centers. It was just running in Google Cloud. Um, the most recent initiative that we just wrapped up uh, last week, actually, uh, we took a, a little different approach uh, where we had one, one large segment. Um, it was about 30 applications where, you know, we called it, we did a lift and shine. So we modernized some services along the way. Um, we still use the M4CE tool and we still cloned you know, some of some of the systems, but we also left behind all of that, you know, on-prem technology that we're all used to, you know, we all know and we all manage it on-prem. We left that behind. So we did plenty in, plenty in Terraform's infrastructure as code. We also had a, another application stack that was just perfect for modernization. So it was completely modernized, all using PaaS services. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, we took this hybrid approach uh, because that was what was really best for the initiative to exit that data center. Jasper? Uh, for, for us, I think it was more driven from what we were trying to achieve. Uh, part of that was we wanted to keep our cost of ownership uh, still within, you know, our control. Uh, so there was a there was a whole premise of that we would only do this if it keeps us just at par with what we are right now spending. Uh, there was also an aspect or a time in between when we are migrating, wherein we tell our teams that because you're building net new systems, do not replicate your data center architectures. Go and pick products which are the right tools for you. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, lift and shine. Uh, we have used some of the stacks uh, currently around M4C uh, for what we're doing on stores, but it's all around, like it's all over the block, I would say. Now that you have actually executed these migrations and some of them are still happening now, what are some of the most impressive results that you've seen so far? Uh, I think two come to my mind. Uh, 2018, when we migrated our grocery business, like right out of the bat, one week after the migration, we could see like a 50, 40 percent improvement in just performance of the stack. Uh, the other example which I would share is, you know, a recent one around stores. What we're doing, we migrated uh, our, you know, stores uh, to Google Cloud, 
and we have had absolutely no incident. And this is coming from a world wherein when stacks were running in the store, there was constant feeding and nourishing which was needed for those stacks. Daniel? Uh, for us, it was really, you know, two things as well. One, the speed to deliver. I've been very impressed with how fast the teams have been able to do migrations and have a working environment ready to go. Um, I, I mean, I'd be hesitant to say that we could do, we could work at the same speed in an on-prem data center. I just, I don't think we could do it. Uh, the other is the operational visibility. It, it's amazing to me. It's not a week goes by that an engineer doesn't come to me and, and shows me something new, some new widget, some new monitoring technology, something that helps them do their job better. Great, that is amazing insight. Now, um, if I, if you were to, there are lots of companies trying to do migration. So um, if they were to take something away from this session, um, what would be one of the best uh, or the biggest piece of advice that you would like to offer to somebody who's looking to migrate, Danielle? Um, I think it's the assessment and the planning is the of most important as much time as possible that you can put into doing an assessment and putting together the migration plan, the more it's gonna pay off in the end. Jasper? Uh, for me, it's actually the opposite. I would say, you know, uh, adhere to the principle of failing fast. So try uh, create enough room for your teams to stumble. There's gonna be surprises. You would get to understand your teams and your culture via this activity very clearly. And you know, just you know, start start early and then stay put. Two very different approaches again, but I think it does depend on the team that 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 people are working with to apply uh, whichever one that makes sense in their scenario. Great. So with that, we are at close of our time. I want to remind you that uh, the announcements that we've made around dual run, which is the mainframe modernization um, feature and the migration center, you can see the links to those if you want to learn more about them. There's a lot more detail at those links. And uh, with that, I want to thank you, Danielle and Jaspal for joining us today and sharing such great insights about um, how you all ended up migrating. It was so unique and so different from both of your perspectives. And um, I think that is what made uh, this discussion very enlightening for me as well as for our audience. Um, and with that, um, I want to thank you for listening and um, enjoy the rest of Next 22. Tecnologia é como se fosse um bichinho que uma vez que ela te morde, não sai mais de você. Eu cursei análise e desenvolvimento de sistemas, só que eu não consegui terminar. Tinha lá aqueles formulários, né? Qual que é o seu nome, seu endereço? Mas qual que é a sua profissão? Eu não tenho profissão. Agora... É a hora de eu retomar, aí foi onde eu vi a oportunidade do Bootcamp da SoCode Academy em parceria com o Google Cloud. E seis meses depois, aí foi onde eu recebi o convite para poder fazer parte do time da SoCode Academy, só que do lado de lá. Ali o mundo sabe quando o mundo ganha cor? Então nessa hora ficou colorido. Eu, Patrícia, mulher casada, mãe de três filhos, 39 anos, profissão, Engenheira de dados habilitada em Google Cloud Platform. All of a sudden, the entire world is connected, and with it, the opportunity for hacking. So this was a group that we had been following and that we knew was a threat. The attacker's after something, and you want to find out what they're after. Remove their power, contain them, and then put them out. We want to change the battlefield. Our mission is to protect the safety of 
all the data we manage for all of the billions of users and customers of Google Cloud, whether it's health, energy, transport, finance, public sector organizations. We make sure that we, we defend and protect that every day, keep it secure, keep it private. I'm Phil Venables. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Google Cloud. When we think about defending the cloud, it's very much the same as defending all of the rest of Google. We have various different groups inside Google overall that are working together to protect our customers. Threat analysis group tracks attackers, analyzing threat actors that are developing techniques against us. There's many other teams that build defensive systems, build software, manage the firewalls, all these other tasks. Our job is to really understand what the threats are, provide that ground truth that allows us to really focus the security efforts of the wider team. When you understand your attacker's motivation, how their techniques are evolving, you can feel comfortable that your defenses are evolving to meet that and stay ahead of that. Then we have detection and response every single day monitoring our entire environment, looking for signs of attacks. Our focus is on gathering the information we need to put the story together. Is there an attacker here? And if there is, then we activate our response team. We like to think they're like a digital immune system. The more you can get information about what's going on, we'll be better defended. Every day, every hour of the day, 100% dedicated. Just all about how we try and stay ahead of that threat. Red team, it's really important to aggressively test ourselves. So we, we have some of the world's best attackers that are working for us. How would they go about attacking things? With every exercise that we run, the, the number of things that an attacker can do becomes less and less. We all look at the output of those exercises and determine if there are things that we can build into the cloud products so that they can get defended from the lessons learned. And then we also spend a lot of time working with external researchers, the so-called bug hunters. If they find an issue with any of our products, they can notify us of that. We fix that. In order to prevent errors, you have to study them. Bug hunters play an important role in looking for bugs from all kinds of different perspectives, which is really, really valuable. If you're coming from the outside, you might notice something that somebody who's on the inside might have actually not noticed. If that vulnerability is discovered, despite the best efforts of, of all of our organizations, you want that discovered by somebody that's going to tell you. Then we have Project Zero, active vulnerability research, looking at where vulnerabilities exist, not just in Google products, but in other products as well. We don't really care if you're, you know, working on another platform. Your security is important enough to us that we're going to invest in that. We have to think about securing the cloud overall, not just Google Cloud. We're giving away our hard-earned experience. We'd rather do that because it defends everybody. More and more organizations are moving to the cloud. Our job is to deeply partner with our customers and their IT and their security teams to help them secure things in the right way, to get their businesses operating, their mission satisfied, without having to worry about the detail of the technology and how to defend it.
welcome. So Nellie and I are gonna be spending the next 20 minutes or so talking through some key elements of how to secure your cloud infrastructure. And by that, we mean your network, your data, and your compute, and how to do it the Google way. So what do we mean by that, the, the Google way? So Google secures some of the largest web apps and services on Earth. We've learned a few things along the way about how to secure this cloud infrastructure. And so in Google Cloud in particular, we applied our learnings to enable some infrastructure securities for you, some that we've sort of built by default for you, and, and other controls that we've made available to you optionally. Today we're gonna to share about some of those security controls and how they work without compromising performance. And that's what we mean by the Google way. So we're gonna cover the topics in this order. I'll cover networking, and then Nelly's gonna cover data and compute. Google Cloud offers a robust set of security tools that help you secure your cloud infrastructure. So first, at the internet edge, we provide this family of load balancers and CDNs for availability and scalability and performance. And then built in right along that stack are several security tools for access control and for privacy and for authentication. To these, we add tools with deeper context and specialized layer seven threat understanding for things like APIs, fraud from bots, and secure application access. And then inside your cloud environment, we have fully distributed set of access control capabilities for both workloads and for our cloud services. And when I say cloud services here, I mean things like BigQuery and storage and Cloud Run. And then we provide a full complement of network level telemetry so taking it a step further, we have industry-leading advanced threat detection capability. But if raw packets are what you want, we provide full packet inspection services with our packet mirroring capability. And that can be sent to a number of different third-party tools that you can find in our marketplace. All the alerts and the telemetry from these products are integrated into our threat hunting, alert management, and unified security systems. Plus, we also integrate with third-party SIM and source systems. Of those, we're gonna focus in on three product areas today. Cloud Firewall, Cloud IDS, and Cloud Armor. So, let's start with Cloud Firewall. We are announcing some significant enhancements and expansions to our Cloud Firewall offering. To set the context, Google Cloud Firewall helps you achieve a zero trust posture via a cloud-native, fully distributed firewall service with advanced protection capabilities and granular controls. You can even achieve intra-subnet, yeah, intra-subnet, micro-segmentation that is applied completely independently of the network structure. We recently launched some new enhancements that simplify configuration and deployment while simultaneously helping you improve network security posture and do so with cloud scaling. We've introduced these capabilities in two service tiers, Essentials and Standard, which is in preview. Essentials is the service tier that forms the foundation of the cloud firewall family. The enhancements here include a new construct for firewall rules called Network Firewall Policies. We have both global and regional of those. Also here are secure tags, objects that can be used in your rules that are IAM governed and also address groups. Taken together, these features simultaneously help you increase policy precision and simplify rule creation and operation. You normally don't get those two things together. And then there is the new cloud firewall standard which as I mentioned is currently in preview. Standard introduces an expanded set of source and destination objects for firewall rules that are dynamic. They are built and automatically updated by Google. These are Google Cloud Threat Intelligence, which I'll cover in a little bit more detail in a moment, domain name or FQDN based dynamic objects, and geolocation based dynamic objects. The combination of IAM governed secure tags and essentials and the dynamic objects in the new standard tier and our existing 
hierarchical firewall rules help you run a very dynamic, least privilege, self-service environment that enforces pinpoint policy with greater simplicity and decreased operational cycles. So I just mentioned Google Cloud Threat Intelligence and how it's a set of objects for rules in firewall standard. Well, those same objects are also available in Cloud Armor and are gonna be available for future products. Today, threat intelligence includes five types of objects. Some are meant for blocking, like IPs with poor reputation and Tor exit nodes. And some of them are meant for allowing, things like search engines, public clouds, and upstream providers. And we'll be adding many more types to the threat intelligence platform over time. So speaking of Cloud Armor, let's go deeper on that right now. Cloud Armor is our service that protects your websites, your web services, and your APIs against advanced, targeted, and automated DDoS and Layer 7 attacks, and also from fraud from bots using recaptcha. You may leverage this enterprise-grade ML-powered defense wherever your application is deployed. So that could be on-premise or in colo, in any of our Google Cloud regions, or actually any public cloud provider for that matter. Cloud Armor attaches to the load balancer and provides layer three and four all the way up to layer seven application layer protection and access controls to the backend services. Cloud Armor security policies can be configured to enforce rate limits, IP, geo, or ASN based access, as well as pre-configured fully customized WAF style application protection rules. This includes our machine learning based adaptive protection capability. Now, we've recently expanded significantly the coverage that Cloud Armor can provide, and we've done so in two big ways. The first is for traffic that's passing through our TCP and SSL proxy load balancers. So basically addressing other types of TCP applications that might be not HTTP or HTTPS or non-standard of those. The second is for traffic heading to our CDNs. So this is going to include our cloud CDN and also our recently announced media CDN. With these two types, we significantly expand the set of workloads in your infrastructure for which you can now get edge protection from Cloud Armor. So when I was describing Cloud Armor just a minute ago, I mentioned planet scale. So you see here that DDoS protection that Cloud Armor customers receive, that protection is provided from techniques that our SREs and our DDoS teams have developed over the past 20 years in the effort of protecting and ensuring availability of our own Google services, things like search and map. Due to the global nature of Google's network, where all of our customers are and where all of our services run, we're able to absorb and dissipate or otherwise mitigate attacks across various components in our global routing and our load balancing infrastructure. So here's a perfect example of why this scale is so important to you as a customer. We recently announced that Cloud Armor's machine learning based adaptive protection capability combined with the recently GA'd rate limiting feature were instrumental in mitigating a massive attack. A Cloud Armor customer was targeted with a series of HTTPS connections, which peaked at 46 million requests per second. That's the largest DDoS attack of that nature to date, 76% larger than the previous reported record attack. So to give you a sense of scale, this is like all of the requests, all the daily requests to Wikipedia hitting in just 10 seconds. And the customer service remained available throughout the attack. The Cloud Armor product team is actually giving a dedicated breakout session to this attack, SEC 201. So be sure to check it out if you want to know more about the details there. So now let's turn our attention to Cloud IDS. This is our intrusion detection system. Cloud IDS detects malware, spyware, command and control attacks, and other network-based threats. Its security efficacy is industry leading because it's built with Palo Alto Networks technologies under the covers. Being cloud native, Cloud IDS is simple to deploy 
It's managed and it provides high performance. A broad overview of it kind of works like this. So it copies traffic from a customer's network, as you can see with the little packet mirror icons that are sprinkled throughout the VPC. Any traffic you want, you can tell it via the packet mirroring policy. So this could be compute engines, this could be GCE, uh, containers and GKE, all the traffic within a VPC, within a subnet even, VPCs to the internet, on-prem, Google services, all of these things can be expected. North, south, east, west. We have full visibility and detection capability. So everything in the blue squares in the middle, that's what we set up and manage for you. Taking the mirrored traffic, it runs to the threat detection technology, and then we let you know what we find. It's all out of band and requires zero forwarding changes to your infrastructure. This dramatically simplifies fulfillment of the IDS security control requirements that are common in several compliance standards, for example, PCI. Cloud IDS also integrates with SIM and SOAR solutions, enabling customers to set up automated threat responses to take automated actions in things like Cloud Armor or Cloud Firewall, for example, all just based on Cloud IDS detections. So it kind of works like this. Looker blocks for these applications, like for example, Cloud IDS and Cloud Armor, are in the marketplace. You just download them and drop them into your Looker instance. The semantic layer parses the JSON messages and represents them to Looker. The dashboards are easy to export, and there's no additional cost for existing Looker users. And again, you can find these blocks on marketplace.looker.com. That's it for networking. Nelly, I think everybody's eager to hear about how to better secure data. Thank you so much, Gregory. And our customers, as you can imagine, now understand how to protect network. And now let's remind everybody that we're protecting network because customers bring in data and workload to cloud. And to be able to protect the data, the first step in their journey is to figure out what kind of data they bring into the cloud. So the first thing is to get a little more visibility and understand where the right data resides. We have good tools to help in this task, and it's data loss prevention. And data loss prevention is not only preventing data loss, but it's also helping to classify and understand what data is sensitive and what data is not. And it's also trying to have additional tool set of capabilities that help customers to de-risk sensitive data. What does it mean? It's trying to remove unnecessary PII data, again, to with tokenization, anonymization, and other techniques. But it's not all. Let's assume that we need to keep fully fully fidelity clean data. You can't anonymize or tokenize it. You have to have it all. And encryption is a very powerful tool. It's helping us to focus more on keys that encrypting this data. Also, encryption helping us to limit the access to this data, to encrypt your data at rest. And let me introduce a few of them a few options. So we have what we call cloud key management services. And cloud key management services helping you to protect your data with full of control that you can apply to those keys. If those keys are actually created and done and all operation, encryption operation, done in software. We have cloud HSMs where all operations and key creation is done in those hardware secure modules. And we have additional product in the market, all of them in GA. And this product we called Cloud EKM External Key Manager. And it's for those customers that want to have full sovereignty of the keys, full sovereignty of their key management system and HSMs, and want to connect their HSM system to the cloud services. All of that in your uh, possession. So let's start with the use case when you need to run your VMs. So when we define and design our confidential computing story, the first step we needed to ensure that everything you're running in this environment is actually trustworthy. And that is why we introduced what we called shielded VMs two years ago. 
Right now, this capability available by default on every single VM you will start in GCP. But not only VMs, but also on Kubernetes, on our GKE, on our cloud data flow, data proc, or any other services around within VMs. And shielded VMs means protection against malicious gas system former and also malicious OS. And all of this integrity check and all of this monitoring information we sending to cloud logging so you can take some actions if you will find uh, the situations that your VMs or your systems are not running as you expect. We want to create this confidentiality, this box around your environment, and provide cryptographic isolation among all our tenants running in cloud. And confidential VMs is actually a normal VM. You don't need to change any line of your code. You can do lift and shift your applications from normal VMs to confidential VMs with simple click. It's incredibly scalable. But also from security perspective, it's one of the best capabilities that we offered. We used special instructions on AMD CPUs to generate the keys to encrypt memory of your VMs. But those keys is the best keys in the world because they're random, ephemeral, they generate it in the hardware, but most importantly, they're not extractable. It means not us, no Google, no you would be able to deal with these keys. Confidential GKE allow us to create the whole entire cluster, confidential cluster as confidential with a simple flag. But again, for developers, they would be able to add special uh, label, it's called selector node. And this selector node is something that Kubernetes audience familiar very well. And it's a way to indicate to Kubernetes engines that this particular application, this particular uh, container need to be deployed to confidential cluster. So again, now we have confidential VMs, we have confidential GKE for very big analytical jobs. We have confidential data proc. And confidential data proc is including Hadoop, manage Hadoop and Spark for your clusters. But a lot of our customers asking us the next step. Okay, we know how to isolate our workloads among ourselves, but how we would be able to collaborate how we would be able to bring all of those data sets, very private data sets together and execute workload or applications that we agree upon without revealing the private data to all of the participants. And that is why at Next, we're introducing a new addition to a confidential computing portfolio called Confidential Space. It's a cryptographic, very hardened box where all collaborators would be able to put the data in and run the application inside of that with full guarantee that none of them would be able to access this data or influence the execution of their workload. And it's an incredible big step toward helping customers to collaborate securely. To summarize, Gregory and I talked to you about the security of network, data, and compute, and how we can help you with protecting network data and compute in GCP. The most importantly, we also emphasize the fact that all of those tools, incredibly easy to use, performant, and scalable. And it's exactly what we mean the Google way. Thank you so much for being with us. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks for joining us at Google Cloud Next. Today, we'll go through how Google Cloud optimizes infrastructure for your unique workload. I'm Chelsea Chop, Product Manager for AI, ML, and HPC on Google Cloud. And I'm joined by Ruin Hess, a Group Product Manager of Storage. And you'll hear from him in a little bit. Today, we have two main topics. We'll go through announcements in Compute Engine as well as storage. So let's dive in to talk through more on Compute Engine. A few years ago, we introduced VM families, and they were created to be optimized for all specific workloads. So let's do a quick refresher of each family. Starting on the left with general purpose, we have cost optimized or efficient VMs, or E2. They provide up to a 31% cost savings compared to our original N1 machines. They provide reliable performance across Intel and AMD, and they can be provisioned with custom machine types or CMTs to only pay for what you need. Going one to the right, we have balanced or N2 and N2D, providing a balance between customization, performance, and TCO. They provide the widest feature set and can also be put provisioned with custom machine types. A quick little reminder for you, the N2D denotes AMD and N2 is Intel-based. Moving another one to the right, we have the newest family, and that is Tau VMs. And they were introduced last year and provide the best performance per dollar and are optimized for scale at workloads. When we introduced Tau VMs last year, it was on the third generation AMD Epic Milan processor. And earlier this year, we launched T2A, our first ARM instance. And we'll dive into more on T2A in a minute. Now for workload optimized, starting on the right, we have Compute Optimized, which provides the highest performance consistency CPUs on Compute Engine. And this is best suited for your high-end web and app serving, gaming, or even your HPC workloads. And I'm really excited to announce one of our first third generation VMs with you, C3. Moving one over, we have Memory Optimized, which provides the most memory on Compute Engine and is best suited for your largest databases such as SAP HANA or Windows databases. And to wind up our workload optimized fleet, we have accelerator optimized VMs with high end performance GPUs based on NVIDIA Ampere A100 Tensor Core GPUs. We'll also get to another exciting announcement in our A2 VMs as well. Now let's dive into our recent launches. Starting on the left with general purpose, we have Tau VMs. Earlier this year, we announced the addition of the Tau family with ARM based VMs, and they're now generally available in Google Cloud extending that rich choices that we already have to offer with Intel and AMD. You can now use these VMs in select regions in North America, Europe, and Asia. And these VMs support key Google products like Google Kubernetes Engine. In addition, there's support for a broad ecosystem of operating systems, databases, programming languages, and so many other tools as well. Next up in our Compute Optimized VM family, we're excited to introduce C3 our newest machine series powered by fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable processors or codenamed Sapphire Rapids. C3 is more than just another CPU update. This is the first VM built on our next generation platform architecture powered by Google Cloud's custom Intel infrastructure processing unit or an IPU. This IPU is the outcome of a deep multi-year collaboration between Google Cloud and Intel. C3 also features new 200 gigabytes low latency networking, as well as high performance IO products, Cloud Hyperdisk, which you'll soon hear more from Ruin about. Contact your sales team to join in on our private preview. Because our clusters can be scaled and parallelized more densely, we're seeing customers and partners like Ansys, Snapchat, and Parallelworks completing jobs must fa much faster and also boosting their productivity. Snapchat, or Snap, was able to obtain a 20% increase in performance over C2 for a key workload. Parallelworks does vital development towards building a weather-ready nation, including NOAA's multi-cloud R&D computing environment. They were able to achieve a 10x faster results running Warp on C3. And Ansys, a leader in engineering simulation, was able to see a 3x performance gain and C3 over C2 running their flagship mechanical products, including Ansys Fluent, Ansys Mechanical, and LS Dyna, due to the higher memory bandwidth and lower network latency that you get with C3. So let's move on to Accelerator Optimize. 
In our Accelerator Optimized VM portfolio, it's a VM that is optimized to run the NVIDIA A100 GPUs. We're really excited to announce today the A2 Ultra GPU VM instance, which is based on the NVIDIA A100 80 gigabyte GPU. This is best suited for largest models with massive data tables like deep learning recommendation models. Uh, the A180 gigabyte reaches up to 1.3 terabytes of unified memory per node and delivers up to a 3x throughput increase over the original A140 gigabyte. For HPC applications with largest data sets, the A180 gigabytes additional memory was able to deliver up to a 2x in throughput increase with Quantum Espresso, a materials simulation. On a big data analytics benchmark, A180 gigabytes delivered insights with a, to a 2x increase over the A140 gigabyte. This makes it ideally suited for your merging workloads with exploding data sets. And we hear from our customers and users all the time that their AI demands purpose-built infrastructure for them to be successful. AI Singapore is a national program in AI supported by their National Research Foundation and hosted by the National University of Singapore. They were able to reduce a large language model processing time by 40% and also gain a 50% increase on text generation throughput over the A2 mega GPU shapes based off the original A140 gigabyte. This allowed their teams to experiment faster with increased productivity. And I'm also just excited to share that Neuro is looking forward to experimenting with our purpose-built hardware for their platform. Now, I'll hand it off to Ruin to talk about new announcements in storage. Thanks so much, Chelsea. Happy to be here. Over the years, we've launched a lot of performance and feature improvements to Persistent Disk. And while we're happy we're, with where we're going with Persistent Disk, we've also taken the time to step back and think a bit about what does block storage on the cloud really ideally look like? From customer conversations, three areas quickly crystallized. Ideally, block storage should be dynamically provisioned, tuned to specific performance and capa capacity needs, and decoupled from instance type and size. Customers should be able to dynamically change performance when requirements change. Also, block storage should be full spectrum, meaning that it should cover all the core cloud workloads, and that for each workload, it should cover the entire spectrum without efficiency or TCO cliffs. And then finally, block storage ideally should be managed at scale with aggregate storage management, including capacity pooling, and with policy-based management. And ideally, with workload awareness, allowing you to set performance requirements to the, in the workloads context rather than tactically at the disk level. Following these insights, we set out to build Google's next generation block storage, and we're now introducing Google Cloud Hyperdisk. Hyperdisk is built to leverage our new IPU-based architecture. It offloads and dynamically scales out storage processing. And by decoupling block storage from the VM, Hyperdisk allows you to tune easily and dynamically the storage to your workload, achieving higher performance, higher flexibility, and higher efficiency. To bring all these capabilities to you, Google Cloud Hyperdisk is an entirely new portfolio. Hyperdisk Balanced is our new general purpose volume type, the best fit for most workloads. It covers a broad range of workloads, offering up to 150,000 IOPS and 2.4 gigabytes a second of throughput. It's joined on the high end by Hyperdisk Extreme, our new premium SKU focusing on the highest performance databases with explicit performance SLAs and up to 320,000 IOPS. For cost-sensitive throughput-oriented workloads, we have Hyperdisk Throughput. With up to 3 gigabytes a second and also performance and capacity provisioning separately. So all of these SKUs have capacity and performance provisioned separately and dynamically, performance decoupled from instance types, and up to 512 terabytes in capacity. All of them will be available for Compute Engine and GKE. And all of them will also be available in hyperdisk storage pools, where you can manage at scale with thin provisioning, data reduction, and policy-based management. Let's have a look at what this looks like with an actual case study. This is a case study of the steps at a high level that you might step through when planning a SQL Server instance. Today, constraints of how performance and capacity management works leads to a complicated balancing act when you try to meet the requirements of the workload. Capacity and performance sizing frequently takes weeks, and you need a detailed understanding of the workload to do this well. Finally, mistakes are costly and can require downtime to fix. 
Hyperdisk allows you to tune performance to the workload without instance restrictions. You can size capacity freely and have actual usage determine consumption without excessive planning and hot grow gymnastics. And performance can be changed at any time if requirements change. All of this leads to dramatic real-world impact. Simpler deployment and management, more efficient use of resources, and an ability to, to dynamically adjust to changing your requirements at any time. So key, three key aspects help you optimize TCO for storage-intensive workloads with Hyperdisk. You'll be able to choose instance size based on workload needs, resulting in smaller instances. You'll be able to provision only the capacity and performance needed for workloads, resulting in less over-provisioning. And for workloads with predictable demand patterns, you can further optimize with dynamic provisioning. If, for example, your workload has a peak that's associated with end of quarter reporting, you can adjust it with dynamic provisioning for that period alone, and then scale back as needed. Overall, we estimate that for common storage intensive workloads, you'll see an average of 50% lower TCO with Hyperdisk. We're very excited about Hyperdisk and look forward to making it available in preview later this year. We have some great sessions for you at Next this, this year. Mod 103 covers the top 10 ways to lower your costs on Google Cloud. Mod 107 covers how to protect your infrastructure with a cloud environment built to tackle today's insecurity challenges. And Mod 300 is about leveraging AI infrastructure to optimize cost performance. From Chelsea and me, thank you for joining our session. We hope you enjoy the rest of Next. This isn't just about some impact at the corporate level. This is really about having an impact at a personal level. For myself, I identify as an engineer. I really want to be able to come into my company, Spotify, and figure out how to have an impact beyond recycling, biking to work, all those sorts of things. They're great, but when you can have an impact that goes global, the path to impact is as important as the destination. Okay, guys, may I just ask, could everyone please have their phones in silent and aeroplane mode? You may not know that uh, Spotify is, in fact, a Swedish-based company. And in Sweden, sustainability is really part of the cultural consciousness. For Spotify, we have decided that we want to contribute positively to climate change. We started with the Exponential Roadmaps goal, which is to get to zero carbon emissions by 2050. Our goal is actually to get to zero emissions by 2030. In 2021, we released our Global Equity and Impact Report. And in that, we outline our path towards net zero for greenhouse gas emissions. One of the things that is part of that playbook that I love the best is our annual Hack Week. So Hack Week is when the entire company comes together to figure out how to innovate across the company. So this year, we set the theme of Hack Week to making the planet cooler. One of the first and most basic things is, of course, we have moved everything to the cloud. With Google, we have the opportunity to leverage uh, a number of products that help us in our technology approach to climate change. And we do uh, auto scaling with uh, products like Bigtable, like GKE. There's a few things that are really at the core of our strategy. One, we wanna have a direct reduction of our own greenhouse gas emissions. The cloud part of the emissions was only a small part of the equation. It starts not just from the the cloud, but it goes all the way out to our end user devices. The second part is to take a look at the emissions caused by all the things that are upstream from us that we use. Not only will we reduce our own emissions, but we'll have a side effect to all the other companies who are using these same providers. And then the third part is really to leverage our unique position to be able to influence people's behaviors outside of Spotify. In particular, uh, not surprisingly, since I lead a group of developers and engineers, to really be able to impact the environment as well. Hi, Tyson. I'm Max. Uh, Max, before we get started, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how you got into engineering. I think it's a very fascinating way of trying to understand and structure the world. How did you get started with engineering? <laughs> I got started with engineering as a, a young man. Uh, my dad was actually a software engineer. My dad was also, or is, a, is an engineer uh, as well. So maybe that's uh, a common pattern that you choose from your parents. I'd love to hear what sustainability means to you personally. Yeah, I am personally worried about where we are. 
I just felt my anxiety increase with regards to climate change. Yeah. And um, I realized that by taking small personal steps, that that kind of milders my anxiety. So we recently had our hack week and the theme was making the planet cooler. Uh, you participated in that, but this was actually the genesis of the climate engineering handbook. Just in a nutshell, can you define what the climate engineering handbook really is? Today it has two parts. So it starts with a theoretical part that discusses where our emissions primarily stem from, device, CDN, networking, and cloud. So we discuss these chapters and, and from a theoretical perspective, try to show where the emissions come from in each of these separate steps. And then um, there is a second part of the handbook, which is a much more hands-on guide uh, discussing what tangible steps you can take um, in each of these disciplines. In this overall process, really a sort of a bottoms up process to democratize access and then action. Tell us a little bit about how you think this will evolve over time. Amazing to see how many people at Spotify actually care deeply about this topic. I think the only thing that's limiting us right now is just people hearing about it. Well, thanks, Max, for being a climate champion uh, for Spotify and hopefully for the world. Thank you. How are you doing? Great. First, can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at Spotify? So here at Spotify, I lead business development for Backstage, focusing on driving strategic partnerships and other opportunities that improve the adopter experience. So what is Backstage? Yeah, Backstage is an open platform for building developer portals. It was built internally at Spotify, open sourced in 2020, and we donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And what's a developer portal? A developer portal is a single plane of glass for your entire infrastructure. So it unifies your tooling, your services, docs, and apps under a unified, consistent UI. So we have these different plugins that they work with Backstage. There was a plugin that came out. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it does? So Cloud Carbon Footprint is actually an open source tool developed by ThoughtWorks. It leverages cloud APIs to provide visualizations of estimated carbon emissions on usage across Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. We want to empower not just Spotify internally, but the broader developer community to be able to immediately measure, understand, and reduce their carbon footprint. Do you think that this has opened the floodgate for more possibilities? There's so much more to come. We believe that climate change isn't going to come from a single silver bullet to solve the problem. Instead, it's going to come from people who are united to make a lot of changes. Engineers, at quite a personal level, they want to have a big impact. It's not just about what we can do to reduce our company's global greenhouse emissions, but what we can do to help everybody else have that same impact. Hi, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. When you're trying to build the national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work.
Thank you everyone for joining our Google Cloud Next 2022 session on how AI infrastructure on GCP helps teams accelerate ML development with optimized performance and cost. My name is Mikhail Kreska, an outbound product manager on Vertex AI, Google Cloud's AI platform. And I'm excited to have three other guests with me here today. We have Kai from Uber, who's a senior product manager on Uber's ML platform, Michelangelo, and Joanna and Sid from Cohere, ML engineers building tools to make natural language AI capabilities accessible to all developers. We'll start with a quick intro on why AI infrastructure is important, walk through AI infrastructure services and solutions available on GCP, hear customer stories about leveraging AI infrastructure on GCP, and then wrap up with a quick summary. So let's start with why is AI infrastructure important? And the best way to start really answering this question is to give you a sneak peek into our customer stories about how they're using AI infra to accelerate development and deployment. Cohere is leveraging TPUs on GCP to innovate faster and iterate faster on large language models. Uber has integrated Vertex AI's TabNet and AutoML services into their platform to allow different teams to leverage these new algorithms. Credit Karma is leveraging Vertex AI's feature store to manage embeddings that feed into their content engagement and offer conversions engine. And finally, Arbor Biotech is leveraging AlphaFold running on Vertex AI to help their scientists predict structures of protein sequences in hours instead of months. These examples and many more cannot be done on general purpose infrastructure. This requires robust AI purpose-built AI infrastructure. In addition to these specific examples, there is a broader trend across data and AI. Data is getting bigger, it's getting multi-format, AI models are getting larger, and more developers are adopting frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, the Transformers Library, and JAX, making AI research and development more accessible. So infrastructure really needs to keep up to make AI models performant and cost-effective. And having access to strong AI infrastructure is becoming a competitive advantage to getting the most value from AI. And this is also exemplified by these two quotes from IDC and Forrester. IDC shares that the lack of purpose-built AI infrastructure is now becoming one of the leading causes of AI infrastructure failing. And Forrester shares that AI infrastructure is really crucial to keep AI teams productive, to keep them experimenting, developing, and deploying rather than just waiting around for large AI tasks to complete. So now let's move into what does AI infrastructure on Google Cloud look like? And we have three pillars when thinking about this. One, flexible and scalable hardware to support diverse ML workloads. Two, manage infrastructure to allow practitioners to focus on experimenting and deploying models. And this is offered through Vertex AI, a fully managed data science ML ops platform. And number three, really easily access state-of-the-art AI with optimized infrastructure and software paired together, really looking to bridge the gap between research and applied AI, what we call research to ready. So with a focus of AI infrastructure as part of an AI strategy, the performance and cost benefits can be quite staggering. Along the bottom, we see some great results where some workloads get up to 6x cost reduction by optimizing on the right hardware. And we've seen some teams go from ideation to experimentation to production in weeks rather than months or quarters with many teams sharing stories of 80% improvement in overall velocity across the ML lifecycle. So now let's dig into some of the specific services. On the hardware side, we're excited to welcome two new AI accelerators onto GCP. First, the NVIDIA A2 Ultra GPU VM instance, this machine has twice the GPU RAM of the previous A2 mega machine, providing 80 gigabytes of GPU memory. This provides big performance gains in throughput as well as latency for use cases like deep learning recommendations and computer vision models, as well as large language models. Second, we're excited to welcome the newest generation of the Tensor Processing Unit or the TPU. This is infrastructure designed by Google specifically for machine learning with support for PyTorch, JAX, and TensorFlow. The fourth generation of TPUs scale to a super pod made up of over 4,000 chips. And each chip has big improvements in flops and flops per dollar versus the previous third generation. In addition to pure horsepower, the data center hosting the TPUs is operating at 90% carbon-free energy with a big focus on sustainability. 
So now let's move on to some of the more machine learning specific tasks. And large scale training is really one of the first ML tasks that requires purpose built AI infrastructure. Vertex AI provides a fully managed training service that eliminates the need to provision and manage clusters. Users can submit and forget jobs with a Python SDK, get out of the box queue management, access to on demand accelerators, and built in hyperparameter tuning. Moving on to the middle, Vertex also provides a new distributed training capability that works with existing frameworks like Horovod or TensorFlow's mirror strategy or PyTorch distributed. This reduction server architecture provides a new way that minimizes latency and data transfer. Benchmarks or language models have shown up to 30 to 40% reduction in training time and cost. And finally, we know many times data feeding into these accelerators can often be the bottleneck. So we're launching first class support for cloud storage and NFS file store as part of Vertex to be easily able to mount these into your on-demand training jobs. For cloud storage specifically, this allows you to use cloud storage's new auto class capability that automatically moves data to lower and colder storage classes based on access time resulting in automated cost savings. Next, we move into the serving layer with Vertex's managed prediction service. First, this is a fully managed API endpoint service. This allows users to deploy their models into auto-scaling endpoints with a wide selection of CPUs and GPUs with minimal infrastructure knowledge required. Within this, we're excited to announce two new capabilities, model co-hosting that allows you to share underlying resources across models for cost optimization, and custom prediction routines, which allows users to include pre- and post-processing Python code alongside your model binary to simplify your architecture. And then in the middle, we're also excited to introduce an optimized TensorFlow runtime only available on Vertex. This leverages model pre-compilation and smart op placement across GPUs and CPUs to drive big improvements in throughput and latency. Early benchmarks show huge improvements up to eight and six X for throughput and latency for tabular data and material improvement for BERT-based natural language models. And finally, deploying models for serving is only half the battle. Uh, Vertex provides model monitoring and explainable capabilities to ensure your models stay healthy or are retrained and redeployed as they erode. Next, AI infrastructure isn't just about training and serving machine learning models. Managing features and embeddings to feed into your ML models is non-trivial. As organizations scale both the number of models and the usage of complex unstructured data as part of these models, feature stores and vector databases can become a challenge to implement. To support this newer AI infrastructure need, Vertex AI offers a fully managed feature store and matching engine. And today we're actually excited to announce support for streaming ingestion across both these services, where you can now have new features and embeddings synchronized and updated in real time to improve the accuracy and timeliness of predictions. And both these services support a wide variety of use cases, ranging from recommendations engines, search engines, image classification, ad targeting, and much more. And finally, we don't wanna stop at just providing hardware and managed infrastructure. We wanna provide a path to adopting leading edge solutions coming from research and partners that can drive true business value through AI. First, we have Tabnet now available through Vertex AI's tabular workflows. This makes it easier to build accurate and explainable models on billion scale data sets with built-in interpretability. On Vertex, the Tabnet pipeline automatically selects the appropriate feature transformations, search space based on the input data, data size, prediction type, and your training budget. We'll hear a little bit more from Kai about Uber's early experience with Tabnet. Second, we have an alpha fold batch inference pipeline in Vertex AI. This allows biotech companies to embed alpha fold into their own workflows to predict protein structures at scale with optimal architecture. And third, we have a solution from our partner NVIDIA called Merlin. Merlin is an end-to-end -end framework to design and deploy custom large-scale recommender systems. We've partnered with NVIDIA to build a reference solution deployable on Vertex AI and GPUs and GCP, which includes data processing, model training, and model inference. Next, we'll jump into some great examples of enterprise teams leveraging some of these technologies. And uh, let's go ahead and start with Kai from Uber. Thank you so much, Michael. Hi, my name is Kai. I'm the product manager for Uber's internal entry and machine learning platform called Michelangelo. Michelangelo powers 100% of Uber's most business critical machine learning use cases, 
such as RISE ETA, EATS ETD, driver rider matching, and its home field recommendations. Allowing our machine learning developers at Uber to focus on what they are good at, building and deploying models without worrying about the underlying infra complexities. Our strategy of building MacAngelo is based on actively evaluating and integrating industry-leading third-party components while selectively investing in key platform areas to build in-house. So we architecture MacAngelo in a modularized way so that we can easily integrate third-party tools and components in a plug-and-play fashion. When we explored the solutions for large-scale model architecture search and training, we found the Vertex AI, AutoML, and TabNet. In the past year, we've been working closely with the Vertex AI team to evaluate the performance of, of AutoML and TabNet with Uber's real-life use cases and data. The evaluation results met the POC success criteria in terms of model accuracy, training efficiency, compatibility with Michelangelo tech stack. So we've decided to integrate both tools with Michelangelo and made them available to all machine learning teams at Uber. On the other hand, along the way, to meet Uber's extensive and complex machine learning needs, we've made multiple feature requests and product improvement suggestions to Vertex AI team, which in turn improves AutoML and TabNet. One example use case is Uber Eats prep time model, which is used to estimate how long it takes a restaurant to prepare the food after order is received. This is one of the most critical models at Uber with the highest QPS, query per second. We compared the tablet results with the baseline model and the tablet demonstrated a big lift in terms of the model performance. Overall, the POC results are promising and we are excited to continue closely working with the GCP team to drive production adoption within Uber. With that, I pass it on to Joanna to talk about their use cases at Cohere. Thank you, Kai. Hey everyone, I'm Joanna from Cohere. I'm very excited to present how Cohere is accelerating large language model development with Google Cloud. Cohere's mission is to unlock NLP capabilities enabled by large language models and make them accessible to all developers with just an API call. To achieve this, Cohere abstracts away the heavy lifting from the end user, including collecting and curating a large corpus of high quality data, training of pre-trained language models, and post fine tuning optimizations for low latency inference in a highly reliable environment. Here, we outline Cohere's achievements in building a scalable training, evaluation, and inference stack. Taken as a whole, this technical stack is a key competitive advantage, which has enabled Cohere to rapidly scale our models while ensuring quality, responsiveness, and safety of our end products, all of which is implemented in Google Cloud Platform. With that, I'll pass it on to Sid. Hey, I'm Sid. I'm a machine learning engineer at Cohere. I'll give a high level overview of Cohere's training framework. So Cohere has a proprietary training framework called FAX. It uses JAX and Cloud TPU v4 to train large language models. TPU v4 pods are some of the most powerful AI supercomputers in the world. A full v4 pod has 4,096 chips. In the diagram on the right, you see a few topologies of slices from the full v4 pod that are available on the Google Cloud platform and that can be used by FAX to train these large language models. Again, Cohere uses FAX to train our baseline models as well as custom models that are trained on customer datasets using the fine tuning feature on the Cohere platform. FAX's job is to consume billions of tokens and train models as small as hundreds of millions to as large as hundreds of billions of parameters. Coming to some concrete benchmarks, in the middle we see pipeline parallelism, which was the old way of training large language models at Cohere. With FAX, the scaling in the plot is represented by tensor parallelism. So for a fixed number of tokens, the tensor parallelism method of training large language models scales much better. And on the right, we see that with using 512 v4 cores, the maximum model size we can schedule is 340 billion parameters. And at a minimum batch size, the step time is 6.21 seconds. This enables us to train large language models very fast and bring those improvements to customers right away. Thanks for having us, uh, Mikhail. I'll pass it off to you. Great, yeah, great to hear those stories from both Uber and Cohere, really pushing the boundaries of AI and really leveraging the AI infrastructure services on GCP. I also wanted to end this with actually two quick stories from two other customers. Uh, first is with Credit Karma. Uh, for those not familiar, Credit Karma is a multinational personal finance company 
that continues to innovate to provide more personalized products and services. And they have a mission to make financial progress possible to everyone. One of their use cases is to better recommend financial content and financial offers for their members. Their approach was to generate embeddings from financial content and mix those with features from offers based on user cohorts to improve their input features for the recommendation system. The diagram on the bottom left gives you a quick system overview of how this architecture works. We have financial content on the left where they used a pre-trained sentence encoder model to extract embeddings. On the right, they also bring in features from financial offers. They bring both these different domains into Vertex's feature store that are then leveraged for training and serving their recommendation engine. And this really had two benefits highlighted on the right side with a few of their quotes. One is really for the internal Credit Karma machine learning platform team. Shout out to Debashis Das, who's been working with us. Um, his team can now launch richer and faster features up to 3x faster. And second is, of course, the user experience, the consumer customer experience. And using A-B testing, they've seen significant increase in content engagement and offer conversion. Next, we have a customer, Arbor Bio, leveraging DeepMind's AlphaFold solution on Vertex AI. Arbor Bio is a biotech company based in Massachusetts, discovering and developing the next generation of genetic medicine. Arbor Bio is really developing an extensive toolbox of proprietary gene editors using both high throughput data screening as well as AI. And why do they really look at Google Cloud and GCP? Number one, they really look to augment their toolkit and processes with DeepMind's AlphaFold model. And they really wanted to inject the capability to predict structures of proprietary protein sequences in a scalable, robust, and cost-effective way. Now, Arbor Bio's data-driven and AI-based approach really has a lot of high variability of hardware needs across CPUs and GPUs. And this was a great use case for GCP and Vertex AI's managed infrastructure. And really the impact you can see with the quote in the bottom right is that our bioscientists are able to increase their productivity and generate actionable insights in hours instead of months. So let's go ahead and, and, and end with a summary. Um, you know, to summarize, we truly believe that to drive the most value from AI, AI infrastructure now needs to be at the core of your AI strategy. We covered three pillars of AI infra on GCP, flexible and scalable hardware, managed infrastructure on Vertex AI, and accessible state-of-the-art AI solutions. And you can see we can continue to invest heavily in each of these with lots of new capabilities and launches rolling out. And finally, again, we're super thankful for our customers and partners leveraging these services, providing us feedback to continue to improve these, and sharing their stories with the broader industry so we can all learn from each other. So thank you so much for joining us today. Please enjoy the rest of Google Cloud Next and have a great day. So the Office CTO was pulled in while Etsy was considering a variety of different clouds, and we worked with them to sort of talk about some of their advantages in machine learning and search, as well as touching on our sustainability initiatives too. I think that type of partnership from the beginning made a huge difference in ultimately selecting Google as our cloud provider. While we definitely know we've reduced our energy consumption, what we're missing is the actual monitoring of energy. They've just kept coming back and listening to us and saying, what do you need and how do we partner with you to solve these problems? I'd say from the get-go, our relationship with Etsy has always been one of aligned values. They've been leading the industry in sustainability, not just in the retail space where they are, but actually across many dot-coms. What Google has done with their you know, cloud infrastructure is be very sophisticated and actually apply machine learning. By doing that, their PUE or power usage effectiveness is much better than a typical data center that we would rent space in. It does go beyond the environment. It involves education, it involves well-being of your employees, and well-being of your customers as well.
Hi, and welcome to Next. I'm Sean Darrington, Group Product Manager here at Google Cloud. Today, I want to cover three different things. One, I want to share some storage best practices around data analytics and cloud storage. I then want to share a little bit of insights around stateful workloads in GKE, as well as some considerations for storage and data protection, and actually give you a couple demos. And then lastly, I wanted to focus on critical applications and different design considerations that you may have for storage, as well as, again, data protection. So with that, let's jump right in. You know, there are a lot of opportunities to gain more value from your data but you have to get the data into Google Cloud before you can begin to run many of our analytics options between Looker and Vertex AI and BQ. And so storage transfer service enables you to do exactly that. We have the opportunity to move data from on-premises, S3 compatible object storage into Google Cloud. We also have the opportunity to migrate data out of other cloud providers into Google Cloud storage. So once you get the data into Google Cloud, now you have the option to actually make sure you know who's accessing what data and where they are. And that's where the integration into our IAM, the Identity Access Management, comes into play. You have the fine-grained multi-tenant capability between projects to define who has access to what data. But then we're also focusing on, with cloud storage, how can we make your life simpler? Simpler in a variety of ways, and that is, number one, making it easy from an operational perspective to get data into cloud storage. Instead of going through data migrations and changing from structured to unstructured or vice versa, Things like Hadoop and Spark, we actually give you the opportunity to use the same file system structure, HDFS, but now you can just transition and simply use GS colon slash slash and begin to run your analytics from there. Again, making it really easy to begin to gain value from the information you have. But, but we're also focusing on how you can take advantage of optimizing your costs across multiple storage classes within cloud storage. Whether you're looking at standard or nearline or cold line or archive, you have a single set of APIs across all of those. So from an application design perspective, you have one bucket, one set of APIs, regardless of which storage class is actually satisfying those requests. But we're also focusing on not only the cost and design application, but also the response time. One of the most important things from an analytics perspective is, can I get consistent millisecond response time from standard all the way down to archive? And with Google Cloud Storage, you can do exactly that. The other thing we're doing is focusing on operational simplicity. That is, every organization is trying to reduce costs over time. With AutoClass, we give you the opportunity to hit the easy button, to turn on at an entire bucket level, whether it be millions, billions, or trillions of objects, you have the opportunity to turn on AutoClass, which will now migrate objects from one class of storage to another by policy without any intervention. And as we migrate storage from standard all the way down to archive, there are no deletion fees or retrieval fees that you may have from an early deletion request of data that might be resident for only 30 days instead of 60. These are all things that make it very easy to optimize the storage costs and where those objects are over time. And this is something that we've recently announced and it'll be excitingly available in Q4. The other consideration is how do you get compute as close to the data as possible? And with cloud storage, you can certainly have a single region and run all the analytics in that region, but oftentimes you want higher levels of availability if something impedes or interrupts that operation in a given region. And so with cloud storage, we've had the opportunity to define dual region replication for years. Strongly consistent replication with a recovery time objective that you can basically design a continental scale bucket, regardless of where the data is being served from, the application doesn't know. But what we've done recently is actually introduced enhanced options so now you have nine options for regions within three continents to choose for that dual region configuration. And you can continue to use that replication that's strongly consistent if you want to. So if your objects are in, in compute in region B, need to be retrieved from region A, that can easily be done. But if you need an extra level of availability, you can also look at the optional turbo replication. This gives you a 15 minute RPO SLA. So now combined with dual region replication, you have a recovery time objective of zero for your continental scale bucket, but you also have now a recovery point objective of 15 minutes. And last but not least, as you look at this design from storage transfer service on the left-hand side, getting the data into Google Cloud Storage, looking at how do you replicate cloud storage across two different regions, the different options you have for analytics, whether it be Vertex AI or BigQuery, you need to think about performance. Everybody wants their data more quickly. And that's where we come into play with our cloud storage option. You have the option to scale that performance almost as much as you need to. We have retail customers today that are using our cloud storage with analytics that are exceeding 10 terabits per second of throughput. Now, not everybody's gonna need that much throughput, but if you do, 
It's an option to design your application that way. And last but not least, regardless of what type of analytic workload you're using, BigQuery or Vertex AI, this is all supported with cloud storage. So many times shifting gears to GKE, many times organizations are looking at stateless workloads and that's been the way that most people have been using that. However, we're seeing more and more customers thinking about stateful workloads where if the pod goes down or that namespace goes down, you can't just regenerate that data. So you have to think about things differently. And that's where backup for GKE comes into play. This is now an offering that we've recently made generally available. It's integrated directly within the cloud console that you can choose to protect your Kubernetes environment. In a few mouse clicks, protect it locally, protect it across another continent, just depends upon what level of recoverability you wanna protect against. And this is something that we do from a very fine-grained policy definition perspective. So whether you're running and supporting persistent disk, you have the option to protect a single application, multiple namespaces, or the entire cluster if you want to. And we have application consistency as well for many of the options so that you can have a crash consistent backup for some, but in some cases you actually want an application consistent backup. Some of the policies that we've actually introduced and give you options for actually protect against ransomware as well. So time lock is a very popular feature that people use to actually apply to a given policy that says, regardless of who wants to delete that backup, it cannot be deleted until the time lock expires of say 90 days. So ransomware may try to, but it won't be able to. So now I want to introduce Manu Batra, who's going to do a demonstration of backup for GKE. For the backup demo, we're going to do uh, we're going to create two clusters. One, a primary cluster called Postgres cluster. We're going to create the cluster in a rapid channel with 1.24. Next, we'll enable the backup for GKE add-on. We'll select specific machine types. In this case, E2 standard 2 and our cluster is created. Now let's create the secondary cluster. Again, in rapid channel with 1.24, with similar machine types, enable backup for GK. So now we have two clusters, one for backup, other we're going to restore that backup. Let's log into our primary cluster, deploy Postgres, Let's log into Postgres, create a table, and insert some data. Let's insert learning GK is fun, database on GK are easy. So when we take a backup and we restore, we'll check if the same table with the data it can be retrieved on the restore cluster. So now let's go to backup for GK, create a new backup plan. We have two clusters. We select the cluster we want to backup. We will give this backup plan a name. It's a Postgres plan, backup plan. We select the target where we want to store the data, and we have the backup plan. Let's take an instantaneous or a quick backup. This is a manual backup. We'll give this backup a name. And let's check if our backup's done. Our backup has succeeded. Now let's walk through the process to restore. Let's create a restore plan. Let's select where you want to restore. We want to restore all the namespaces in the backup. We want to create new volumes on backup. So we're selecting all the options for creating a backup plan. Let's keep default for restoration rules. Now let's go back to backup for GKE. We have a new backup for GKE, restore plan for Postgres. We have a new backup. Now let's restore this backup with the plan we just created into the new cluster. As you can see, our restore was successful. Now let's log into the new cluster and see if the data that we created on the primary cluster and all the config has been recreated into this new cluster. So my Postgres workload is recreated onto the Postgres cluster restore. All my config, storage classes, settings, BBBC claims are also restored. And the data that I took a backup for is already available. So that was a quick demo. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Manu. 
Stateful workloads obviously have to be protected via backup for GKE, as we just described. However, if you're thinking about multi-writer applications, oftentimes pods need access to consistent storage. They need access to persistent storage, and that's where Filestore comes into play. Filestore is an NFS managed storage service that you can use for GKE, and we have been able to do this for a while with, C with the CSI driver, the Container Storage Interface driver. We have some new news that we've announced regarding Filestore Enterprise and some options there, but if you think about how you can have tens, dozens, or even hundreds or thousands of pods accessing the same data, that's what we provide with Filestore. It provides highly available storage, so if pod one goes down, pod two still has access to the exact same NFS mount point. And from an operational perspective, Filestore supports non-destructive upgrades. So as we add more features over time, we incrementally improve Filestore, that upgrade is gonna be non-disruptive to your environment. You don't have to plan for downtime when you're, when you're doing this. This just happens in the background. The other option, depending upon the level of applications you're running and the availability requirements, is Filestore Enterprise actually has a 4.9 SLA. That regional SLA ensures that data is replicated across three zones within that region. The new option that we've introduced with Filestore Enterprise is multi-share. This is the option for you to take a Filestore instance, let's say one terabyte, and carve it up into smaller shares to provision across multiple pods. So now you can provision as little as 10 gigabytes per pod that your admins need. Very simple to do, you create a storage class, then your, your GKE admins can then create PVs and begin to consume that. But let's dive into a demonstration and take a look at this in action. In this demonstration, I want to show you Filestore Enterprise and the new multi-share capabilities to use with your GKE clusters. So let's get started. Uh, so first of all, we're actually going to create a cluster uh, in GKE. We're actually going to use the autopilot capabilities to make things uh, simplified. Uh, I'm going to call this cluster uh, stateful cluster. Uh, I'm also going to use uh, rapid channel for the file store multi-share feature here. Uh, this is going to enable us to not only create the cluster, but then make sure that the cluster is uh, properly connected. So I'm going to click create here. And uh, now I'm going to begin to configure the managed storage uh, with Filestore. This is going to use a CSI driver, the um, container storage interface for this. It's going to make it really simple to do. I'm um, also going to show you the YAML file here for the storage class. Um, this shows you the storage class is using Filestore Enterprise, which is important. But you also want to make sure the multi-share is set to true. This is going to give you that functionality to have the smaller shares um, down to 10 gigabytes, if you will, within uh, Filestore Enterprise. Um, now. Once I do that, now I'm going to actually run the PVC uh, YAML file, uh, and you'll actually see that I'm going to do this with a single uh, persistent volume uh, in, in, in this provisioning process, and eventually be bound to the cluster. Uh, now, you can do this with multiple PVs if you want to, uh, but in this instance, I'm just going to do uh, one PV uh, and 100 gig uh, of the multi-share within Filestore Enterprise. Uh, now, I'm not going to actually show you some of the YAML files for the reader and writer deployments. Uh, the reader pods uh, are actually going to be exposed by the load balancer for users to view. And this is what I'm going to actually show you at the end here to show you how uh, the multi-writer capability of Filestore supports this. Um, we're going to just choose uh, 20 writer pods. Uh, these will all simultaneously write to the same shared storage every 30 seconds. So in this case, it's writing to that one PB uh, Filestore Enterprise that I created uh, every 30 seconds. So I'll refresh it so you can see uh, that increases. Uh, also skip the, uh, the YAML file for the load balancer. Uh, this basically just exposes uh, the reader pod to Filestore. And here's the URL that I clicked on to actually show you that I've got 20, um, uh, 20 writer pods writing. And as I refresh this, you can actually see that it's recording all the writers that are writing to the shared NFS file system, uh, the enterprise uh, uh, that I just created. Uh, it'll actually show you when I refresh this that the same um, uh, writer host names match each other as you go through this. And that's as easy as it is to use Filestore Enterprise and the multi-share capabilities. Great. The last area I want to share with you is some best practices with storage and critical applications. One of the things that we've been focusing on with critical applications is our block storage offering, Persistent Disk. We've recently announced HyperDisk. HyperDisk is the next generation Persistent Disk that we've kind of rethought what block storage should look like in the cloud. We think it should be able to be dynamically provisioned. With block storage and particularly HyperDisk, we want to give you three dials, if you will, to turn, IOPS, throughput, and capacity. Based upon how you need to size your application, you can tune all of those independently. But we also want to give you the ability to tune those across a wide variety of workloads from throughput-driven workloads to IOPS-driven workloads. And we want to make it easy for you to manage capacity at scale. Managing 10 terabytes of data is very different than managing a petabyte of block storage. 
And that's where we've recently introduced Hyperdisk Extreme. As the name implies, it's gonna satisfy the most demanding IOPS-driven database workloads like SAP HANA. And that's gonna be suited for a percentage of applications, but really the top tier percent of applications. We're introducing and announcing Hyperdisk Balance as well. This is gonna support the widest range of applications from throughput oriented to IOPS driven. And last but not least, we have uh, Hyperdisk Throughput, as the name implies, those that need gigabytes per second of performance, not necessarily IOPS driven performance workloads. So all of these we've rolled out over time, Hyperdisk Extreme will be in preview this quarter. But underlying all of these is really about how you can optimize the storage utilization with storage pools. With storage pools, you can think about thin provisioning as we're used to in the on-premises world, now brought to the cloud. So you can create a pool of storage, allocate that storage to multiple servers, and essentially over-provision storage and only use what you need to use. Thin provisioning brought to the cloud with storage pools. But let's take a look at what this looks like in a SQL Server provisioning environment. Today, with persistent disk, on the left-hand side, there are a variety of steps you need to go through. Different persistent disk options have performance characteristics. You have to size the VM accordingly, and you have licensing implications oftentimes associated with the, v the vCPUs that you're provisioning for that application. And if you get it right on day one, that's great. But if it changes over time, and you have to go back and reprovision re performance and reprovision persistent disk, that can oftentimes cause a lot of complications. If you look at the right-hand side, Hyperdisk dramatically simplifies this. You have those three knobs, IOPS, throughput and capacity to turn on day one to provision what you need based upon the application requirements and size the VM to what the v application needs, not what the block storage needs. Additionally, over time, after month six or tw month 12, you can actually dynamically change that performance characteristic, IOP, throughput and or capacity as needed. So one of the things that Hyperdisk Extreme is very well suited for is the most demanding database workloads like SAP HANA. This is an architecture for SAP HANA that's highly available within a region, but then also replicated to a second region for full disaster recovery. As you see, the HANA database is supported with Hyperdisk Extreme, doing synchronous replication with HSR. Now, that's covering the database side of things, but what about the shared files, those combination of media files, app server, et cetera, binaries that need to be used for SAP. That's where Filestore Enterprise comes into play. Filestore has four nines of regional SLA availability, which means that we're synchronously replicating across three zones within a region. So if the media server is in zone B, goes down, the media servers in zone A have access to the exact same data. Recovery time objective of zero, recovery point objective of zero, just like the HRS replication of the database layer. But thinking about the database and the app and the shared file use case is important. We need also need to think about backup and DR for the entire system. And that's where Google Cloud's backup and DR that we recently announced comes into play. This is one of the things that now within, directly within the cloud console, you can choose and set a policy to choose GCBE, GCE, other applications and databases seamlessly protect locally and or remotely. So combination of Hyperdisk, file store, and Google Cloud Backup and DR, you can protect the entire critical application environment. And with Backup and DR, we have a continuous incremental backup strategy. So you're gonna maximize that storage utilization either in region or across region, in addition to having very fast recovery time objectives based upon that incremental forever backup policy. With that, thank you so much for joining me today. Please check out Google Cloud's channel on YouTube for additional tech demonstrations and deep dives into many of the technologies and topics that I touched on today.
and welcome to our session on modernizing your data center and accelerating your edge with Google Distributed Cloud. I'm Brad Bonnet, Senior Director of Product Management for Google Distributed Cloud. And with me today is my partner in crime, Rohan Grover. Hi, I'm Rohan Grover, Director of Outbound Product Management for Google Distributed Cloud, and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, Rohan. Today, we are seeing a transformation that is happening across multiple industry verticals. We are seeing a lot of use cases in retail, with companies like Loblaw, the largest retailer in Canada, is joining a journey of digital transformation, evolving from a traditional retailer to a technology leader. Loblaw is looking to use distributed cloud features to add new capabilities like self-checkout and enhance the future of in-store customer experience. The telco vertical is another industry where we are seeing significant traction. Bell Canada is looking to drive operational efficiencies, increase network automation, and deliver richer customer experiences for their 5G network modernization initiative. Using the distributed cloud will enable them to provide increased speed and bandwidth capacity to the Bell 5G network and support applications that respond faster and handle greater volumes of data than previous generations of wireless technology. Another key use case is in the public sector where we see demand to use innovative technologies at the edge to increase worker public safety. Later in this session, Rohan will talk about Australia Post and how they are using GDC and our Vertex AI solutions to improve worker safety in their warehouses. The really challenging aspect of this transformation is that the expansion often leads to operational toil for the platform and IT operators and teams who build and operate across these sites. When we talk to IT admins, enterprises are increasingly concerned with security, governance, and managing at scale. Complexity increases across edges, sites, and clouds due to disparate control planes and generations of legacy applications, data, and infrastructure. As a result, many organizations' plans to modernize and transform have stalled or are not delivering the results needed for their business. Standardizing development, security, and operational tools enables enterprises to increase flexibility where it matters, modernizing infrastructure, applications, and data. To do so, however, requires operating platforms that can securely scale from on-premise to edge to the cloud while remaining open to change, choice, and customization. And that's why we built Google Distributed Cloud. GDC is the next evolution of our edge journey. With Anthos at its core, GDC is a cloud-centric platform that is, enables enterprises to run modern applications anywhere consistently at scale. We offer a wide spectrum of solutions from managed software on your own hardware to fully managed hardware and software services to a completely air gap sovereign offering. GDC enables customers to standardize development, security, and operational tools to build and modernize application infrastructure and using VMs, containers, and Kubernetes in their data centers, at their edge locations, and in the cloud so they can run more applications in more places. It uses Anthos to deploy Google's leading cloud-centric Kubernetes platform, GKE, and adds enhanced management, security, and compliance monitoring features. Flexible by design, Google Distributed Cloud brings Google technologies to where you need it most. Based on an open source foundation and a vibrant partner ecosystem, Google Distributed Cloud gives customers the flexibility of solutions, operations, and form factors to meet their unique needs. It has built-in intelligence. We bring leading cloud services like Vertex, AI, and ML to where the data is being generated and consumed so customers can harness real-time insights across deployments. It's secure by default. You can scale with confidence using the best of Google security across edges, devices, and our planet scale network from the simplest to the most sensitive workloads. And last but not least, it gives you consistency at scale. It uses Anthos, our cloud-backed control plane, to provide a common experience for developers and IT admins across 
any environment. So GDC can run in and help you manage your environment in any way you choose. We have a variety of different offerings to match the needs of your business. And it starts out with our GDC Edge, which gives you a fully managed solution of hardware and software in one connected environment. We also have GDC Virtual, which are software-only based solution that allows you to bring your own hardware and manage it from our connected control plane. Last but not least, we have our hosted uh, option. With GDC Hosted, we give air-gapped hardware and software that can be managed by Google or a trusted partner for the most sensitive workloads in the world. So our journey so far has been an evolution. It started with Anthos launch in April of 2019, and we've continued to double down and innovate on this platform. And continuing on that strong momentum, today we're very excited to announce the general availability of our GDC Edge GPU optimized configuration for your AI and ML graphics intensive workloads. Many of our customers from retail, manufacturing, and automotive sectors are already testing this new GPU optimized SKU to deploy visual inspection and worker safety applications in their facilities. With the GDC Edge GPU optimized config, you now get the horsepower of 12 NVIDIA T4s that can ha together handle up to 300 camera feeds at the same time. This opens up a whole new window and segment of on-prem applications that need to return results with low latency and high accuracy. And so with the GEA GDCE GPU config, we're very excited about how customers are gonna innovate with this new capability. And now I'm going to hand it off to Rohan to talk about the GDC services. Thank you, Brad. It is so exciting to hear about all of these innovations. And I'm going to talk to you about how one of these customers is using this innovation in a few minutes. But with that, I do want to talk about our portfolio of Google Distributed Cloud services. One of the core value propositions of Google Distributed Cloud is our commitment to provide a variety of services both for Google technologies as well as our open source and third party partner ecosystem. With our commitment to open source, we believe that we can innovate faster and allow customers to deliver their business outcomes. For our public sector customers, using our open source foundation also provides some guarantees of portability as well as meets their sovereign and compliance requirements. Now, if I talk about Google technologies, I'm super excited to mention that our industry-leading AI ML capabilities are now available on Google Distributed Cloud. We announced this back in June, and this includes our Vertex AI ML set of solutions. One of the key services under that portfolio is Translate API. This allows us to translate text in hundreds of languages almost instantly and opens up a whole host of use cases in industries from uh, finance to manufacturing and public sector. Another key AI technology that we are opening up on the Google distributed cloud portfolio is Vision ML. And I'm going to talk a lot about how Vision ML, ML en enables one of our customers as we move forward. In addition, we're also allowing customers to use our database services on Google Distributed Cloud. One of the key use cases for data on the edge is sovereign requirements. A lot of countries, a lot of industries, including finance, have requirements to have data locally. And because we've enabled our new Omni database service in Google Distributed Cloud, they can now use either our Postgres SQL database or an Oracle database to do just that. Our services journey is evolving, and over time, we will continue adding additional Google technologies as well as open source and third-party services to the portfolio. So to recap, Google Distributed Cloud has offers designed for greater choice and customization based on your unique needs. Let's talk about a few of the customers that are adopting these solutions. GDC Edge and Virtual, which is our connected portfolio, they're being used in multiple industries. Some customers in the telco field that are doing this include AT&T, Bell Canada, Telenor, as well as Reliance Geo. We have customers from other verticals, 
um, including financials like HSBC, who are again utilizing the capability of our platform to provide unique value to their customers. And last but not least, we have the media and entertainment type of customers like Major League Baseball and uh, Telegraph, uh, who are also using this to provide cutting edge experiences for their customers. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Google Distributed Cloud Hosted, which provides air-gapped hardware and software solutions to meet the most stringent of sovereign requirements. We have partnerships with the likes of T-Systems in Germany, as well as Thales in France, so that we can work with the public sector agencies in these countries and really meet all of their compliance requirements. We are super excited with the traction that our Google Distributed Cloud portfolio is seeing across the board, across multiple verticals and multiple countries. And I now want to talk about one specific use case that is using one of these technologies. So Australia Post, as we talked about, is an extremely large Australian public sector organization. It is a postal, mail, and logistics company that employs 35,000 uh, workers across the country, and it delivers mails and parcels to millions of their customers across Australia. Um, this company has multiple distribution centers or warehouses that are spread across Australia, which they use to store all of these millions of packages. And one of the key concerns that their execs had was around worker safety. As you can imagine, a warehouse is a fairly chaotic place and lots of things can happen. And the reality is 90% of safety incidents happen as a result of human behavior. So our goal was to minimize the amount of safety risk exposures. And the way we did that is we used one of our innovative AI technologies called Vision ML, which is part of our Vertex AI suite. And we put that on our Anthos-based Google Distributed Cloud solution. This solution aggregates feeds from all of the cameras in these warehouses and then essentially pinpoints worker safety issues. One key worker safety issue is, as you can see on the slide, there's a forklift that's going dangerously close to an employee. Now that could result in injury or even death. And our AI is able to pinpoint those issues and essentially teach the workers and teach the staff at these sites to avoid some of these issues. Our objective was to provide a 50% reduction in safety risk exposures. What we achieved in our first pilot site deployment over nine months is an 83% reduction in employee risk exposure. It's a phenomenal result. And as a result of that, Australia Post asked us to do this in production in 29 major sites. And with that, we achieved a mind-blowing 98% reduction in safety risk exposures. As you can see, this technology is already helping organizations around the world. You can see multiple examples of this. There are verticals like manufacturing, where you can imagine this technology being used for the same use cases. You could also see this being used in retail stores. Um, let's say there's a spillage, and the AI technology can help identify the spillage and prevent a customer or an employee from causing injury to themselves. So with that, uh, I do want to hand it back to Brad to take us home and summarize the session. Thank you, Rohan, for walking us through how our GDC services and application ecosystem have evolved over time, as well as that deep dive into Australia post. What a fantastic outcome. So today we started off by talking about how we're seeing the world evolve and drive needs for use cases outside of traditional cloud and how Google Distributed Cloud is best suited to meet those needs. We talked about our portfolio of solutions with GDC Edge and Virtual for connected use cases and with GDC Hosted for our disconnected sovereign use cases. Finally, we talked about our services and application ecosystem and how Australia Post is using one of these services to solve a real world problem. I wanted to thank my awesome co-presenter, Rohan, for being with me today, as well as all of you at home for watching this presentation. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and thank you. Hi, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. So you gotta do that at the end when you say Big Chicken. Big Chicken is Shaquille O'Neal's emerging fast casual restaurant chain that focuses on big fun, big flavor, and big food. When you're trying to build a national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. 
You know, Josh, every time he does a presentation, he just loves Google Slides. As the person responsible for our marketing, probably the best at Google Slides. His presentations is like I'm at a movie sometime. I'm just sitting there going. I've got some great new chicken sandwiches for you to try. Brand new recipes. <coughs> Isn't there something important we're supposed to be talking about? Good recipe development comes with collaboration. Using docs in Google Workspace gives us the tools we need to collaborate together. Shaquille's life gets crazy busy, as does our entire board. When you want to talk to me, make sure you put on my Google Calendar. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work. Farmers, they have an interest in sustainability, but what's been lacking historically for growers is having the data and the tools that they need to be able to do that well. And that's the reason we're so excited to work with farmers, to give them the guidance that'll help them succeed. I'm Tyler. I'm Adam. And we're the co-founders of Agrology. We'd been kicking around the idea of how do we use a lot of different sensors and machine learning and sensor fusion to deliver predictive insights to our growers to thrive in a changing climate. Traditionally, growers, they try and do these predictions themselves, but they can't be on every inch of every farm every day. They also have to deal with a climate that's changing on them that makes every year harder and less predictable. We use TensorFlow and Google Cloud to train the models that take our data streams and turn it into predictions for our customers. The aha moment for us was when we first saw the results and predictions for the first growing season. That was huge. If we can tell a grower if their crops are at risk of stress or if they're approaching some irrigation thresholds, we can warn them if they're approaching wilting point in a particular area of their field. The process for preparing to work with farmers is first jumping onto Google Earth so we can understand their land. And then we have to think about where we could put our devices in their fields to deliver them insights. Our app takes data from our sensor arrays in the soil and in the air, and it runs it through our machine learning models to make predictions to warn farmers about problems before they emerge. The synthetic models we generate, the forecast models we generate, it's just impossible without TensorFlow, without Google Cloud taking all the data from every block, from every site, and forecasting that three to four days out. That's just something that you're not going to be able to duplicate with a single human being. Giving growers the tools to actually see what's happening in their field is the key to helping them be more sustainable. It's thrilling and it makes the journey and the challenges worthwhile.
Hi, I'm Snehal Patel. I lead product management for Anthos and GDC Virtual. I'm really excited to talk about Anthos and all the innovations we are bringing to help you solve your most pressing problems, help you solve your customers' problems. Today, we're going to talk about three things. Number one, what is Anthos? Number two, what's new with Anthos? And number three, how does Anthos power GDC as well as the capabilities on GCP and multi-cloud? So let's get started. Today, customers want a cloud-centric and container-based operating model everywhere. Container adoption continues to expand rapidly, and that means more apps and infrastructure are being modernized in more locations. Financial services companies are creating advanced risk analysis models. Retailers are rebuilding e-commerce platforms and reimagining retail edge applications. Entertainment companies are analyzing game statistics in real time in ballparks. And healthcare companies are using advanced AI ML to research new therapies. This expansion too often leads to more operations toll for the platform and the operating IT operations team who build and operate container platforms for the developers and the application operators. And it's not only expansion outside public cloud, hybrid and multi-cloud, but growing use of clusters in Google Cloud as well. All these development test and production clusters, plus all the different clusters for tens or hundreds of different workloads, either newly built, migrated, or modernized from legacy, can become difficult to configure, monitor, secure, and optimize. Anthos was created to address the growing demand for hybrid and multi-cloud solutions for enterprise customers. Anthos is our cloud-centric platform to run modern apps anywhere consistently at scale. This means Anthos runs on Google Cloud. Anthos runs on other public clouds, such as AWS and Azure. Anthos runs on premises like data centers. It also runs on premises like edge locations, stores and restaurants. Anthos is the platform that brings all those pieces together so you can have one common platform that simplifies your operations and brings consistent security and governance across the board. So what problems does Anthos solve? Number one, it helps you modernize apps and infra in place. Next, it helps you scale large multi-cluster applications. This is one of the top concerns from customers who've deployed Kubernetes at scale. Number three is to bring consistent governance and security in all the environments. Our customers identify this as one of their top challenges. What is included as part of Anthos? Right? To start with, Anthos operates in all the environments, whether it's Google Cloud, on-premises, AWS, Azure. We also have something called attached clusters. We'll get to that second. Right? Next, what we want to do is Anthos, we can manage all of it the entire cluster lifecycle management from GCP. What this means is through GCP, you can manage a full cluster lifecycle management in any environment. This is what I call Kubernetes as a service. Next is Kubernetes at scale. This is where you can, our, we help our customers simplify multi-cluster automation and configuration. Imagine hundreds and thousands of clusters. How do you manage them? How do you deliver same consistent governance and security? How do you create landing zones for your developers so they can focus on developing apps and not have to worry about multiple clusters? On top of our multi-cluster automation is compliance and governance. Allows our platform teams to define policies, whether they are organizational policies or standards-based policies, so you can bring consistency in every environment. Next is to use service mesh to bring micro-segmentation as well as visibility. And third is around operations, which means understanding your performance SLAs for your applications, whether we are meeting them or not, and then taking the remediation action to get the SLAs we want. We also integrate with developer experiences and services, whether they are GCP or third party. We'll talk more about it in the later slides. So now that we know what Anthos is all about, let's talk about what's new with Anthos. All right? So first, we made it simpler, easier, and has less friction. Number two, now we are delivering consistency at scale, meaning multiple clusters, helping your developers focus on developing apps and not the infrastructure. And number three, now we can expand Anthos and GDC 
to your retail edge locations. So let's start with the first one and do a deeper dive. First, it's a fully hosted GCP service that allows full cluster lifecycle management no matter where you run. Meaning your clusters can be running on GCP, your clusters can be running on-prem, your clusters can be running on AWS, Azure, or other public cloud. You can manage those clusters directly through GCP, either through our consoles or through our G Cloud. It's a fantastic way to automate this. It's a fantastic way to bring more uh, capabilities to, uh, from an operations perspective. Next is the attached clusters. Remember we talked about this before? So if you already have Kubernetes deployed in other clouds or other environments using other Kubernetes orchestration or platforms, and you want to bring the same consistency and same Anthos solutions to those clusters, what do you do? A simple way is to attach those clusters into Anthos, what we call attached clusters. What that means is that once you attach them into Anthos, it takes a few minutes, then you can apply same policies. You can bring the same observability. You can also bring the same fleet-like capabilities to all those clusters. It's a fantastic way to get started sooner and delivering value sooner to your dev teams. Next, single pane of glass. Everyone wants this. We have it, right? Number one, uh, from Anthos on GCP, you can see all your clusters no matter where they are. You can do a deeper dive into them, get better visibility. All right, so that's enough about how we've made it simpler. Let's talk about how we help you scale. This is our number one ask from our customers. How do I scale? How do I scale? How do I scale? Right? So we are delivering a lot of innovation to help you get there. Number one, uh, why do customers end up creating multiple clusters? As a number of, they want to create a large operating environment. And once they create that large operating environment, they can create different tenancies. Each tenancy, uh, within the same operating fabric made up of multiple clusters. This is something that we call multi-cluster management via, via fleets. Now, what does this allow you to do, right? Number one, you can create different tenancies. You can apply the same set of security to all those clusters, meaning now your dev teams don't have to worry about figuring out how to secure them. Your platform team can apply the same policies to every cluster. As soon as they apply to a fleet, all the clusters get the same set of policies, same security configurations. So what does Anthos multi-cluster management via fleet do? Number one, visibility. All your clusters across the entire fleet, you can get the key status and configuration information. Number two, it's as simple to connect into a fleet. Go in there, connect, voila, done. Third, you can start assigning different features. Let's say you want a common config management across all of them. Let's say you want to apply the same service mesh capabilities to all of them. Number three, you could also do uh, common identity services. You can deploy cloud build and cloud deploy as well. This makes it super powerful, simplifies the management across multiple clusters. This is our brand new dashboard for fleet or multi-cluster capabilities. It helps you fleet-wide visibility for your container infrastructure across all your environments. Includes key information about resource utilization, infrastructure, policy violations. It also integrates with cloud ops for deep analysis and alerting. Compliance and governance. Once you define your policies, either standards-based or based on your own uh, organizational policies, the dashboard allows you to get quick visibility into which policy violations are there whether they're in audit mode or they're in enforcement mode. It helps you better understand how, what you need to do to remediate and get back into compliance. That is something we are super excited about. A lot of our customers, this has been our number one ask from our customers. All right. Now let's talk about expansion to the retail edge. Who's excited about this? I am. All of our customers are. They want to deploy Anthos to Retail Edge because this allows them to fundamentally transform the Retail Edge. Right? It helps them bring personalized offers, worker safety without having to replace their existing store infrastructure. How good is that? Right? So what, what are our customers trying to solve for? Number one, well, it's not easy. Right? Let's start with that. Number one, the app deployment cycle is long. There is limited operational visibility at scale. Imagine hundreds, thousands of locations. There are multiple failure dimensions. 
you hear things like someone by mistake knocked the power cable and down goes the infrastructure. You have other things like you have a heterogeneous mixed infrastructure. You have applications that were built to run on VMs. You have ap modern applications that are designed to run on containers. Can't have multiple platforms. You need one way to manage all of that. GD Anthos, powering GDC Virtual, helps you solve those challenges. Number one, through Anthos, we can deploy fast and secure applications across the board. You get op unified operational visibility. You get resilient architecture, meaning if you lose connectivity or if you have limited connectivity, your applications still continue to work, meaning you still get to deliver value to your customers. And number three, it leverages your existing infrastructure and hardware partnerships that you might have. To do this, we've recently delivered Anthos for VM. It's a unified cloud-backed management for containers and VMs. So what does this really mean, right? Imagine a deployment where you've got your modern applications, but you have some third-party apps that are not going to be containerized. What do you do? Anthos allows you to migrate those apps to Anthos for VM. And now you have a common platform to manage both of those. Number one, it provides a unified dev and ops experience for your VMs and containers. Number two, it's a developer self-service provisioning of VMs. It's a declarative deployment model for simplified DevOps. It provides the same policy enforcement for consistent compliance. We also have a tool that we deliver that allows you to quickly determine whether that VM-based app will work on the Anthos for VM runtime or not. So that is amazing amount of uh, innovation that we are delivering, and I'm super excited about it. So how does Anthos power all of this stuff on GDC and GCP? It's a lot of stuff going on, right? So number one, Google's Anthos helps bring cloud operating model everywhere, whether you're on GCP, whether you're in Azure, AWS, or on Google Distributed Cloud. Anthos powers both of those. It gives you common control plane. It brings container orchestration and management across both of them. It brings common policy and security automation, and it brings operations and service management. Anthos powers GDC in three ways. Number one is Google Distributed Cloud for the Edge. This is where Google delivers a managed hardware and software solution designed for low latency and data resiliency and hybrid workloads. Number two, and GDC Virtual. This is our software-only solution that works on your hardware and your OS. It's great for retail edge. It's great for environments where you want to leverage your existing hardware investments. And the third one is a completely air gap solution called Google Distributed Cloud Hosted. On GCP and multi-cloud, Anthos powers three ways. Number one, Anthos runs on GCP, right? It delivers an integrated solution that brings together GKE, fleet, service mesh, policy configuration, and security on GCP. Number two, Anthos on multi-cloud. It brings together Google's Kubernetes, fleet, service mesh, all the other capabilities we talked about to AWS and Azure. And finally, Anthos Attach Clusters. It's our, it allows our customers to attach their existing clusters into Anthos, so you can take advantage of our service mesh policy configuration and security to, for your, all your existing Kubernetes clusters. So to recap, Anthos is our cloud-centric container platform to run modern apps anywhere consistently at scale meaning it runs on Google Cloud, it runs on other public clouds, it runs on premises, data center, and it runs on your edge. We are delivering three key innovations. Number one, we've made it simpler and easier. Number two, we are delivering consistency at scale. Think hundreds of clusters or thousands. And Anthos now expands to retail edge. Thank you so much for your time. I'm super excited with all the innovations that we have. I'm super excited to help you innovate and deliver new capabilities to your customer. Thank you so much for your time.